just an incredible sighting to be able to watch these lions as they move past us. And uh, what I do enjoy about the colors, especially early part of the morning, is what they refer to the uh, as the golden hour. Oh, there's the young male also coming closer. We'll see now. Look at his... Um, the colour of his mane, especially now with the sun. That little cub is literally taking him down. Is that the... It is the young female. She just couldn't resist. Like, she just wants to play with that mane. And look at how he's just tolerating all of it. See how she's trying to get a grip of his mane. Oh, she <laughs> she climbed onto his back. Often with cubs, there's something that just fascinates them about it: lion with the mane. You'll even see when the, the when their dads are around, how they tend to play with that man. But now, it's first playing with each other before they draw their attention back to him. Here is the big bull. Now, if you look at that tree, there near his feet. He's done that. He did that just after we were having a look at the breeding herd that's close by. You can see that he is a must. Not too badly though. You can see that he's dribbled urine onto his legs there. You can see that darker color. That's what happens during must. And also, if you look at his temporal glands, they're on his forehead. He's also secreting from those. He doesn't smell too bad. Now, when an elephant is truly and in the thick of must, he will actually be dribbling urine constantly and he will almost always have his penis out and the scent is substantially stronger than this at the moment it just smells musty or as I once read in a book like a badly maintained men's toilet which is quite accurate Now we're speaking about these secretions and often we see the ones on their heads. But what is the secretion called? We know it comes from the temporal gland. We know it happens when an elephant is stressed. And I mean that from a biological point of view, biological stress, maybe it's too hot, maybe it's too cold, maybe they're thirsty, or maybe they're going through a hormonal changes like with this bull. But what is that secretion called? Use that hashtag Wild Earth or the hashtag CGTN Wild and let me know what you think. Remember that it 
will be signal uh, signaling things to other males and to other females. So the chemical composition of it will be quite complex. So let me know, what is that secretion from the temporal gland called? Hashtag CGTN wild, hashtag wild earth. Welcome back everybody. Well, we've been trying to follow Tlalamba into this horrible drainage and uh, well we've lost her but um, we found a daker and now we've been found by two about to walk past the car obviously two spotted hyena have just in the last moment arrived the second one is on its way now they're obviously on the trail of her as well so this could be actually could bode quite well for us because we've been trying to track her she went into this drainage depression and oh, that's one of the youngsters and we've no idea where she's gotten to but if anybody can find a hyena ladies and gentlemen it, i mean a, a leopard it is a spotted hyena and they are looking exactly where we've been looking but to please help her to come out of the depression there guys because oh they're right behind the car i do apologize about that this is a live show everybody let me try reposition the uh, get a hyena on camera properly for us there. We're also trying to show you the drainage line that she's gone into. It's the ideal leopard habitat. It is leopard habitat through and through. And we're going to position ourselves here, wait with these hyena, and maybe they'll find us. Tlalamba. Hello, boy. It's okay. He is literally in front of me right now. He is massive. <laughs> hey, that's okay, we're your friends. We're your friends. Hey. He actually is dribbling urine from his penis sheath at the moment. They can become very aggressive during must but you'll find that a little less so with the African elephant than with the Asian elephant, which is where actually the coin, the term was coined. Must in Urdu literally means drunken or intoxicated. No head shake, just was curious about us and off he goes. Hmm. That was amazing. Indigo girl, you say temporan. And Daniel, you also say temporan for the answers to our quiz. Well, you both, you are absolutely right. I am happy to tell you. Temporan is streaming from our must bull. Now he wasn't actually too smelly which I am happy to say. But temporin does contain a whole lot of proteins and lipids um, as well as ketones and aldehydes. So ketones and aldehydes are very smelly compounds, basically. Now what that means for the elephant that's actually communicating something with that compound, I have no idea. It's almost a chemical language and they're speaking a chemical language that we can't understand with our actual conscious mind. But biologically, we speak in chemical languages too. We also have secretions that other humans can pick up on, even though we may not be actually conscious of it. He was, oh, he was marvelous. I always call them gentle giants. I know in must they can be very, very aggressive, but I've not found them to be that way um, unpredictably. I found them that they will come up to you and they're not scared of you 
and they will give you a head shake, but they're not unpredictable. And if you just talk to them, let them know, well, not by what you're saying, but the sound of your voice, I'm here, I'm not a predator, I'm not going to harm you, but I'm here, and they're comfortable, and there you see him walking away with not even a head shake towards us. Hello and welcome back to the Masai Mara. I am here at the river, not very far. The river is off to my right and it's only about maybe 100 meters. There is nothing much at the river, so I decided to show you something else. We have two lionesses here walking regally, doing their morning patrol or catwalk, so they call it. These are the Mogoro females. They haven't eaten in a day or two. They look very in need of a meal. I'm going to take a closer look with my binoculars to see if they are lactating or not. Um, looks like they are not, but I can tell their teats are swollen, so it's hard to tell um, if they're being used or not. I have to take a closer look later on. Uh, to confirm because we've been thinking they are they've been pregnant um, I don't think they've given birth but you can tell those teats are really swollen they might have some cubs but I will confirm that to you oh that is an action shot I decided to go to the bathroom there they are heading back towards the elephant grass to off in a distance that is the, uh, hardy, their hiding place. They've been hiding in this um, elephant grass for the last couple of weeks. We've been seeing them. Yeah, when it's going to the bathroom like that, you don't want to be downwind. It can be very smelly, believe me. It is very smelly. Yes, you don't want to even be close to there. It is like tear grass, tear gas being thrown at you. I've never experienced tear gas, but I see people crying without being hit by anything. That's what happens. Yes, yeah. Uh, definitely, I tell you guys, those teats looks like they are being used. So, looks like uh, the one behind could have some cubs. Looks like they're being used, even you can see on the screen, very swollen. Uh, the one sign that we look for is, you know, being you look around the nipple and it's usually very brown in the first few days. It looks like, you know, the cub has been struggling and licking the teeth, so making and changing the color of the, uh, you know, hair around the teeth, you know, to be a different color brown. And they've been going to the same spot every, every day there to the long grass. They've been there almost a week. So, um, let's pray and let's hope that, you know, they have cubs. I wouldn't say anything right now. Uh, Gigi will be coming here later on. And we might be lucky, so I don't know. Um, looks like um, the, you know, the one behind might have some cubs, but um, I'm not 100% sure until I confirm on those teats that they are being used. These two cubs are playing so much this morning. So this young female has moved off to right now. The brother, of course, just stalking her. Well, now they should be keeping up with mom, but of course, being young and full of energy, play time comes first. Now you'll notice there's some elephant dung right in the middle of the road. Now early on, they both were playing with that elephant dung and then eventually drew their attentions towards one another. That one just got a stick. So that's the young female now moving. You can see there's a little bit of an attitude there.
Oh, uh, this boy has come back. Hey, boy. I'm just going to let you enjoy this. And I'll only just really be talking to him because he is a very close. His trunk is about a meter away from me. So I'm just going to let him let him see that it's all good. Hmm. He was actually a little bit close and I had to hit the dash because he actually made me a little bit nervous. Yes, you're very impressive. You are so, so impressive, my boy. You are so, so impressive. Hmm? This is... <laughs> He's a pig. He's listening to me very carefully. He's just trying to suss out exactly what I'm doing here. Hmm? But he responded very well to tapping. Uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. Go on by. There you go. There you go. Uh-uh. Don't touch. Don't touch. No. Uh-uh. 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 No touching. No touching. Come on, my boy. Come on, my boy. Hmm? We're friends. Yeah, everybody's looking at you. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. You even have an ear, a hole in your ear for an earring. Yeah. Yeah, he smells a very, very strong off as we just discovered. Temper no, boy. Uh uh. Uh uh. Uh uh. Okay, I'm gonna have to bang on the dash now, guys. No, boy. His trunk was coming a bit too close. Come on, time to move off now. Hmm, time to move off now. You can see he's not displaying too much, he's just a little bit curious. You are stunning. You are stunning. Hmm, there we go, there we go. Yes, Kitty, you say you love it when they rest their, tr their, tr their trunk on their tusk. The boy is falling asleep here. Um, I do too, but in fact, it is not the, a sign of the most relaxed animal. It's actually kind of him, him being a little bit uh, fidgety. That's probably the best way to describe it. It's him being fidgety, like you would twiddle your thumbs or something like that. When he rests his, his trunk on his tusk, that's what's happening. I was being so nice, boy. Just trying to move past you guys. Have a good look at you before we go and you came up to say, hey, you look familiar. Oh, off he goes. But do you see what I mean? We've, we've spent some time with elephants and we've seen when they display to us, they come close and shake their heads and you'll hear their ears hit against them. He didn't do that once. He was curious about us and he was under the influence of must. So he was just, he was not aggressive, but definitely, definitely made my heart thump. I'm sure it made yours too. And we have these two cubs joining up with mom. Now, there were some white crested helmet shrikes off to the right earlier on, and that young female tried to stalk them. Len eventually lost interest, went and chewed on a stick and decided to go back to mom. Let's see what the young male is going to do. I'm sure he's probably just want to go and have a drink. Because you can see with their bellies, they are full. But um, there's always space for a little bit more. So he'll just greet mom and then try and have a drink. You can see mom 
early on in the morning. She probably they've been suckling quite a bit during the evening because they haven't moved too far from where they were last seen. But um, see, the young male is leading the way. She's telling her mum, "Let's go this way." But I'm sure she's just going to eventually find a spot to to lie down. Just looking at the other lands that are behind us, but they've gone and um, moved off to the right in the grass. So let's see if we can move slightly closer to where these cubs are. You can see the one is looking back to the lands that's just behind us, or slightly behind us. Let's try and see if we can follow them for a little bit. But what we want to do as well, so the most important thing here is we don't want to push too close to these cubs and let them run off. We don't want to affect their behavior. So what we'll do is as soon as we see, there's always this boundary when animal feels comfortable with the vehicle being around it, um, as Trishala was explained a bit earlier. So if we do find that space, we'll quickly stop. But what I want to do is just quickly stop and let you have a look at the young female and the male. Now there is this little hump in the road and the young male was using it as a bit of cover from the female. So he was lying down, see the hump right there between us and those lines. So the, the young male was lying down there and as the female was moving closer, he basically concealed himself completely so she couldn't see him. But I'll try and see if we can just slowly move a bit closer. But it is just absolutely incredible to be f able to follow lions. So think about think about it in this way. So these are actual wild lions moving, and we have that opportunity to follow them and, and experience their behaviour. Okay, welcome back, guys. I was talking about these guys potentially having given birth. The reason I am thinking that is they haven't moved from this area for the last almost 10 days. I have seen them here and my colleague David has seen them here. They were quite way out away from the grass and they decided to go towards the same spot. They haven't reached where we normally have seen them in the last week, you know, 10 days. But they are looking there, you can tell that female is really looking in that direction. It's like she can hear some calls that we cannot, maybe because, um, you know, um, upwind. But let's hope, you know, they have some little cuties. The puzzle now lies on which males have sired these cubs because um, the um, four males of the six pack from Mushera Mash, where, you know, I have seen them, uh, seen them here, and, you know, when we started the show, but they have crossed back and they were seen two days ago across hunting and they're not back. Are they, they the fathers to these cubs? But for sure, they will have, you know, these cubs will have fathers because they will have, you know, um, male lions because there's no way a female can agree to sire or you know to sire some cubs with a male that he you know she doesn't trust so definitely they they are confident that you know they you know those males that have sired the, you know cubs with belong to them and that's why you know if they have cubs do we have males I have seen one remaining here he was seen about five days ago, but the three of the four crossed over the other side and they haven't come back. I haven't seen any males in the last three days with them, which is typical when they have young ones, they will separate themselves from everybody and make sure that they nurse the little ones 
uh, for up, up to about around three weeks before reintroducing them to everybody else. Where they are is a prime estate. This is every lion's dream to be a place like this. There is good cover, the river is not far, and all animals come to drink here. Yeah, very nice for Isaac to have spotted some uh, lions this morning and any day we see cats is a good day here in the Mara. We have a topic crossing there and just passed a small lapwing there, which he thinks the black-headed lapwing. And look at this topi and notice the grass here, it is very short. Now the trees you see in the background there, that's where the Mara River is, and ideally Isaac is not very far from there. The Masimara is a very huge game reserve and you could have so many of us at different uh, positions. That's what I'm guessing to be the black-headed lapwing and they will normally nest, you know, on the ground. They will mate on the ground and then lay their eggs in small little nests, incubate them. And if you look at her carefully, she tends to blend in very well in the grass. But when you're lucky to see the eggs, the eggs blend even more than her. I'm not sure whether you can hear her calling. Quite territorial lapwings. And they tend to guard the area they stay in. This is very common for most lapwings because that's where they spend their time. She must have gotten something there for herself. Maybe some kind of worm. They're very good in terms of getting the food. Sometimes they go and you see them knocking the ground using their feet and then worms will come up to find out what's happening. And by so doing, they feed themselves. Zebras. Thompson gazelles. And here the grass is very short. Once in a year or sometimes twice in a year, we'll have some fires in the Masumara and the fires here are man-made. They are not natural fires. And we got a bastard there. Oops. And a starling at the same time. That's very interesting to have, it, to have them together. And that's what's called black-bellied bastard black-bellied bastard and I'm happy you're enjoying all this and two starlings there and not sure what they want to the bastard the bastard is definitely bigger than them and the starlings could either be the Hildebrand starling or the superb starlings the two are very similar the lapwing is getting close to them it's very nice to see three different bird species in the same area now by virtue of the grass here being very short, they can easily definitely access food and see what to look for. Thompson gazelle, preferring short grass, which is quite nutritious for them. And more often than not, they'll just graze and graze the whole day, unlike the impalas, which are mixed feeders that will feed on grass or sometimes browse. The Tommies will always prefer the short grasses. This could be very good country for cheetahs, having the tommies and this short grass. Common zebras, or the plains zebras. They have some birds riding on that particular moving there. And my guess, those could be ox pickers. Let's see if he's gonna come out the other side of the bush. And the ox pickers will always get some parasite from their bodies. You'd imagine such big animals having parasites like mites or ticks on their bodies. There's no way they'll ever get them out. But occasionally we have seen zebras trying to roll on the floor to try and maybe get rid uh, of the would-be parasites. Or sometimes they try to suffocate them. I'm just guessing that some two ox pickers having a ride, but actually they are looking for some parasites on the back 
of that zebra. Very nice to see zebras, one of my favorite uh, mammals of this size. I let them enjoy their breakfast as I move on. So have a look at the young females heading straight towards that young male just to probably have another bit of a play. Oh, or not. He's probably just waiting for his sister before they head off to their mom. But look at the way that he runs very elegantly. Um, <laughs> now the sister is also is running but didn't look as smooth as, as that young male. But imagine both of them being able, like, if they do make it to adulthood, how beautiful these lines are going to be. Karen, I also love all the lines, especially with them being so playful. Now, they are moving uh, quite quickly, um, trying to catch up with mom. So mom's right there, we can see her. So I just want to ease a bit forward so we can get another view. Shame the young male, only watching it from a distance, we'll try and see if we can get a bit closer so we can have a look, was uh, trying to take down his mum, so biting her back legs to force her almost to stop. Probably not trying to force her, but just very playful. Stop like this. So when you notice, if you look at these little ones, do you see that their ears are pricked forward and not necessarily pricked backwards? So that's a good sign to us in the fact that we're not disturbing them. Because if their ears were constantly towards us trying to and constantly looking back, to, uh, especially to see where we are in relation to them, then it means that we are influencing the behavior. So at least now, they, they're just enjoying um, the early morning time and not being affected at all. See how the, uh, the young male's moving towards the mom. Welcome back to Juma, everybody. Well, we were not able to follow up on Columba. She disappeared on us, although we could hear her calling a few times. We weren't able to find her again. We found a black-backed jackal that is caught and is busy eating a scrub hare. Now this is incredible. I've never seen a jackal catch a scrub hare before, although uh, this probably happens all the time. Jackal are very opportunistic hunters and they will feed on many, many, many different organisms as well as grass and fruit. Very adaptable to surviving in these areas and there are many scrub hare around. But it's quite fresh, you can still see there's blood. Uh, if you're a sensitive viewer, just bear in mind that there are plenty of scrub hair around. The jackal is a predator, and they are a mesopredator, and they help to balance the small herbivore population, including rodents and hares and small birds. So it's all about balance. So you're just seeing a predator-prey cycle right here. And look how careful he's being, or she eating, 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 looking around. Anything could sneak up on this jackal in this moment, namely a leopard. So it needs to be careful. It's going to eat as much of that hair as it can. Everyone's saying, wow, indeed. Wow, indeed. We were driving along and Thea got very excited. And I was like, okay, Thea, it's just a jackal. And how cool is this? If you're sensitive view, everybody, bear in mind that you can look away right now. The animal is dead, there's no pain, and this is the circle of life. Nice, enjoyed the top half. Wow, how incredible, everyone. Let me know, send through one word tweet. Let me know how this makes you feel. Squeamish is okay. Hello, Lisa. Okay, so out in the landscape, we've got your apex predators. Sorry, Carol wants to know what's a Mesa predator. In your landscape, we've got your apex predators. So lion, leopard, hyena. And then Meso predators are essentially the low order predators. So jackal, uh, if you're in North America, you'd probably think coyote. Um, all of those small little guys, badgers even, I think, to a degree. Um, predators are in a cascading effect. You don't just have 
great white sharks, you have a multitude of smaller sharks below the great white and a whole lot of other predators. You don't just have the apex. Same as in birds of prey, you have the apex predators, the massive big eagles, and then you also have the smaller ones underneath. And that is to balance, because you don't just have large prey, you also have small to medium sized prey, and someone needs to deal with that. And it's very important to understand the role of meso predators. I remove them from a landscape. For example, it happened in North America. They removed, um, I think it was coyotes, and oh, he's got the ears. They removed coyotes, and then you saw an enormous boom in smaller sort of animals, smaller predators below them that they used to control. And then you saw changes in the rodent dynamic. So as soon as you mess with the system, so if we remove jackal, um, you're going to see an increase in, in rodents. You're going to in, see an increase in smaller sort of herbivore mammals that would otherwise be dealt with to a degree. You can't just have lion. You need to have all of the other intricate layers below them so that there's balance. Wow, oh, he's eating the head, everyone. Nothing's going to go to waste here, it seems. So 50, you say impressive. Well, it is a very good one. Scrub are very quick, but jackals are also extremely fast. So we've got mongoose around here, lots of mongoose. Dissection, Lisa, dissection. Very slow. This is Trisha's ball game right here when it comes to dissection. So by having the cascading effects of predators, everything in the landscape is balanced. If you remove, as I said, a certain uh, predator species, you're going to see an influx or an increase in one animal species. I think in North America, we saw huge increases in deer because of the removal of wolves. Now, I put the wolves back in, they will control the deer, but then you need to have all of those other predators in place because otherwise you're going to see an increase in this, this animal, that animal, and unfortunately, Prey animals do need to be controlled to a degree, and there is a delicate balance between predators and prey. Remove a predator, and a prey animal can get out of control, and it really will change the landscape. There's no better example of it than the studies done in Yellowstone National Park, where the reintroduction of the wolves has actually changed the flow of the river. So predators, everybody, we might all think, some people might think, oh, predators are the worst. We don't like them. They form a very important role in the ecology of an area. Very important role. Unfortunately, there's huge conflict with predators and humans around the world. <laughs> they do eat nearly as fast as wild dogs while he needs to. Wants to get as much of that in its belly as possible, and the belly's looking really full. Now, it might carry this. It might carry this somewhere. Yes. Okay, well, I think I might see if I can follow it for a little bit. You're right. Yeah. It's on our fire break here. Yeah? Now, I've seen jackal burying carcasses for later. This one might have a den, and that would be something very, very special to see. Well, you should find out if they got a, a den there. Now, these warthogs here, which will not live in dens, they'll always be on the move more often than not. Not sure what scared them there. She just stopped and looked at us. But these are warthogs. They have so many piglets. If you look carefully between the two, not sure there's a male and a female, but just see the piglets running in the grass there. They lose run, stop and look. So it's very windy at the moment and uh, the wind might be affecting their you know, senses of uh, hearing and how funny how they run and stop and look. Between the two, you'll see carefully some small little babies there. Two of them, two the warthog on the left, but initially I had counted six. So not sure one is sitting down or is just having a poo break or just resting and watching 
a task of you know, just confirming everything safe for them. And how often every time they walk or run, they'll always have their tail up. We have always wondered, is it a leaf flex? See the piglets running there. Or is it a follow me sign for the piglets to see mama or the male? See that? Now there's a lapwing that just made some call and that's what they're looking at. How beautiful, eh? I don't, they, they normally don't parent their piglets together, you know, both male and female. It's always the female on her own. But I think in this case, you might have both the male and female. And one of them stays back when the mother runs with the piglets. I think one just wants to make sure all is good. See, for the others, tails up. Piglets run. Can't trust anybody in this grass. We have seen predators like cheetahs or leopards going for the piglets very easily. How exciting was that? To see them just run through the grass there. Now, my whole idea to come in this area is because it's very open, it's very flat, and there could be a possibility, if we are lucky, maybe to see a cheetah. They love this kind of countryside. If you're lucky, why not? Let's keep trying. There's a, just to show it to where that line is, is there's a, quite a few wildebeest. You might just hear some snorting sounds in the background. Now, she wasn't looking at possibly hunting one because she was just moving and then by chance stumble across these wildebeest. But because they know she's here, she's not too fussed about them. She's actually just carrying on moving. So let's see if we can get another glimpse. She's just moved behind that one uh, branch that we can't really see. Um, see the cubs here so i don't want to just drive in there i just want to go forward and see where is she in relation to these wildebeest and then there she is now if you notice her body language she's not really stalking she's just moving um and the wildebeest is just left of that alarm calling at her now the cubs aren't with her at the moment and it might be that as soon as she moves past she could just start calling them and they'll join up just want to move. Ah, oh, there's the cubs moving in the tall grass. You'll see where that little gap was where we saw her earlier. There's the one. Young male and female. And that's strange, like that young female doesn't know what's making all that noise. So she's a little bit hesitant to head it down in that direction. They blend in so well. Look at the colors in comparison to the grass and the area around it. So, Tony, with, I have, to be honest with you, I haven't really, um, I'll answer the question as we carry on. You can see the wildebeest just running in the road in front of us. So, I'm, I'm sure that, especially with lions, they will be a, a bit wary around snakes. Um... Especially what we have noticed before, especially if they are moving and there's something moving in the grass, they immediately move away from it. But I'm not too sure with the whole interaction around it. And I don't know if it's been documented before, but uh, that female is... And if she carries on this way that she's doing now, there's a good chance you might be heading down to the river where she's had a den before. And it might be because the rest of Pride is somewhere here and they could be looking up for opportunity to hunt. She could possibly go and uh, hide these cubs away again before or, or while she's going to go and hunt and then go and fetch them again because it's very strange that she's moved away from the pride now but taking the youngsters with see they're just moving they're also a little bit more wary because of the wildebeest um, that were
welcome back and my two girls have decided to take a very serious nap yeah looks like they are zonked out they are fast asleep remember where they are i don't think it's windy at all because they are protected by the long grasses all around so it must be nice and hot there is a lone elephant out of the blue he just appeared they are so big but yet they can blend in really well in bushes we didn't see him or see her and she just appeared from nowhere um, looks like um, she is headed off to my right I don't know where she's going I don't know also if she's part of a bigger herd that's inside the bushes uh, we live to see that because it is rare to just see or one or by all itself. Oh yeah, there we go. Yeah, there is more. So it definitely looks oh and more and more coming out. Yeah, did they just cross the river? We'll tell you if they have that, you know, um, water mark, you know, on the in, in between their bellies or maybe at their ankles or knees. We usually can't tell that, you know, they, they've crossed the river by, you know, the color. Sometimes they have those two-tone, two-tone color. And that's how we can tell these girls are very fast asleep remember where they are is a prime estate it's an area where most animals pass and this time of the year when the migration is happening there is a crossing not very far off so it is very easy for them to see them running um, very you know when they're very confused and it's easy for them to grab one or get one um, it might sound like I'm just saying, you know, they just walk there and grab it, but you know, the you know the cover that's surrounding the whole area makes it such an added advantage for them because they can ambush the animals when they're running in this long grass and just get one. They have been eating very well, but for the last about maybe about four days, they haven't really eaten uh, anything. We haven't seen them uh, eating. They were far out when I saw them earlier on and uh, they decided to move back towards the grass. I think they noticed that you know, it was getting hot at the same time there was nothing much around. Remember they are called opportunists. So if an opportunity prevails itself in, in, in terms of you know, a warthog, a zebra, a wildebeest, they will go for it. Yeah, those elephants, uh, I don't know how many there are in there, but at the moment I can see four. There is those ones on the screen, and then there's uh, one, the first one we saw earlier. So those four looks like they're part of a breeding herd, so definitely there could be some young ones. Jay, you know, you ask about, see, you know, excessive heat um, interfering with their hunting. Of course, it can, but um, here it is not extreme. Even on the hottest day, there is always a breeze. And the hottest day here would be around 30 degrees Celsius, which is around 105 Fahrenheit. So it is hot. We don't get to that um, normally. The first time I ever experienced that kind of heat was in the month of February, about two years ago. It was really, really hot. Um, nowadays, normal temperatures are about 27, 26, 28 Celsius, which is very comfortable if there's a breeze. So. Uh, the temperature, the kind of te temperature we get here doesn't stop, you know, the lions from hunting in the heat of the day. Although the success rate is much higher at dusk and dawn and also at night. Yes, these guys are in sleep mode. And it doesn't mean that if something passes by and they hear it, they won't go for it. While lying like that, they can pounce and accelerate from 0 to 60 within a very few seconds. You know, 0 to 6 seconds, they can be able 
to be running at high top speeds but they don't have endurance they can only sustain that speed for about 100 meters or less and then they are tired they build more for strength and you know fighting you know that's what they really are meant for you know really using the power to cling on to an animal and really make it tired before killing it that's what they build for i always remind everybody that people say they are lazy but they are not i tell you you know these guys work for their food if you see them bring down something big like a hippo i had i've had many chances of seeing them bring down something big you know they will really you know work on it up to around two hours and that is sheer power that is strength you know to sustain that kind of fight is you know you have to have power um, and that's the tactic and that's the technique they have to tire it down before bringing it down yeah here comes some more ellies that's really nice well i don't know what's gonna happen here because if these elephants get close to the lions definitely one is gonna get kicked out of the way so i'm gonna wait here and if it happens we'll share it with you well i'm really hoping that happens for you isaac on my side i'm hoping to find a leopardess I have tracks for her going into the drainage that I'll show you now because I'm going around. But none of them coming out, which means that she is very likely in that drainage. Hello, a sheep in Africa. How wonderful to have you on the continent. You'd like to know if we have frost in the morning here at Juma? Not really. It gets really misty, especially when it's very, very cold, but there's still moisture in the air. But we very rarely get frost, and that's because the temperatures don't plummet as much as you would need for there to be frost. It's a very warm climate, it's humid, and even when it is cold, that frigid kind of cold is very momentary. I've just got her tracks. Hmm. So you'll find that the animals here will not have extra shaggy coats and things like that. And they don't have a winter coat because we don't have that kind of cold. But let's learn a little bit more about the systems, the geography and things like that down here at Juma. Southern Africa has a rich variety of life. From aardvark to zebras. It is home to almost 10% of the world's bird, fish and plant species. Covered with rolling grasslands in the west and the low fald in the east. low-lying subtropical climate, charismatic large mammals feast on the natural vegetation. Where broadleaf trees and thorn trees coexist, interspersed with long grasses.
leopards use the dense thickets to hunt. And the trees of the woodlands as their personal pantries. To the northwest, the savanna biome is one of the largest, occupying one third of southern Africa. The Kalahari is home to a diverse selection of animals. Where a healthy population of lions thrive. Always in competition with one another. Smaller predators effortlessly blend into the environment to catch their prey prospering from the nutritious grasses and palatable scrub. This is an important stronghold of iconic antelope. Southern Africa's diverse landscape allows for a multitude of species, both fauna and flora, to coexist and thrive. South Africa is home to such a wide range of habitats, biodiversity hotspots, and of course, wonderful animals. Now we're talking about leopards using the density, especially here in Juma, to hunt. And here are the tracks that I found leading into this drainage. This one here, you can see she's walking straight, and then she just turns off in here through this path, actually, very likely. Now, the thing is, a leopard can crouch down and you're never going to see it. But you need, a, you need something to alert you to it. I know there's some kudu down on that side. It'd be nice if I could see some squirrels because then they'd also alert me to the fact that there'd be a leopard around, but she most definitely went through the drainage here and did not come out on the other side. So she's in here somewhere. No other tracks up the road at all. Nothing for a leopard. We can listen out together. Nothing. Now the most exciting part about this being live is that you can be with me when I find this leopard. leopard. You can be part of the whole activity because it's difficult to find a leopard. Every now and then we get lucky and we have this, this moment where a leopard is in the road and it's just amazing and we're lucky. But every other time we've got to work hard and the fact that this is happening live and it's not just Juma, it's across several locations in Africa means that you can be part of the action. And there's nothing quite like that moment where both you and I together find that leopard. Welcome back. Looks like um, our elephants are milling around there. There must be something very delicious there because um, it's only every now and then that I see them lifting their trunks and heads up they were really meaning to come this way then all of a sudden they turn left and there's something there i cannot say exactly what it is i'm not allowed to drive off-road in this area and particularly for elephants uh, because you know we can uh, sometimes find them very close to roads so um it's hard to, for me to tell you exactly what they're feeding on but they are all milling around the same spot they were intended of coming this way then all of a sudden they stopped and started feeding on something. My lions are, could I say, dead asleep. Only sign of life here is a twitch every now and then or a movement of the leg.
Dulu san, um, I had your name, sorry, but the question, um, please could you reframe it again, the question? Could you ask again? How many ground birds living in the Mara? Is that the question? If that's the question, uh, yes, there is um, a very wide variety, you know. Uh, I think, you know, there are very many wagtails, cysty colors, uh, barbets, southern certain ones. Um, we do have ground birds like uh, Kohans, um, the geeses, all those owls, grass owls, they live in grass. So, you know, we have a very wide variety of them. I don't know how many, but it's quite a good number. Our elephants are inching in, but heading off to the left. You never know, even going that way it could be easier for them to pick up the lions because they will be downwind. And the reaction usually is very fast when they pick up the smell or the scent of the lions. They usually just lift their heads up and heads towards uh, where that smell is. And they do know, you know, how close they are because they have very sensitive noses. And and they, uh, and they will know if they are close or not. Yeah, so let, uh, you know, I'm going to be here waiting for them to, you mean, in case anything happens, you know, we will be able to share it with you. And I'm expecting that to happen because now actually, you know, they're heading downwind, which is very prom promising. Yeah, very interesting to see uh, an issue two of the big five together and you know talking of uh, lions and elephants it reminds me of a particular sighting one time i saw of uh, three of the big five lions and elephants and rhinos together and they had such uh, an engagement which was not a bit nasty because the lions wanted to hunt a baby rhino i've gone further in the open uh, areas that I was talking about that have very short grass which I was expecting to look for a cheetah or find a cheetah I haven't been lucky to get one but I've been lucky to get these zebras feeding, feeding on this very short and nutritious green grass and what we want to do we have seen some more of the piglets like we saw earlier but here it is one parent with four piglets and they are more in an open area than what we had before. This is another set. And they'll always, you know, give birth to three or uh, four piglets, you know, at every uh, litter. And I look at the piglets carefully and notice they're eating at an angle. And what they're doing they got their front legs bent. Each of them are doing the same. And eating very close to the mother. Don't want to get any chances. And good to hear that these uh, piglets to you look very adorable. Remember we come into you live from the Masai Mara and we like uh, you to engage us with comments and questions as you show you can tweet hashtag CGTN world or hashtag world earth the youngsters kids questions at worldearth.tv on emails you can ask us about something about those piglets that you see there their survival rate but just make sure they're not very far from mama Very vulnerable to many predators, including birds of prey. Well, I don't know what spooks them there. I will move on, still crossing fingers uh, for a cheetah for you. Okay, welcome back, guys. Look at this. Uh, yes, like I told you, you know, they, was, they were going to pick up the smell they have and they have to give way to the true king of the jungle yeah 
he's, you know, they are no joke elephants. They will chase lions, they will kill them. And here the girls have got no choice. You notice that that's the only female that has picked up, you know, the girls. And she's very persistent. She's not like, you know, okay, you're off where you are, so I'm gonna leave you. It's just like, you know, she's making sure they're off the radio. <laughs> yeah, get out of the way. Yeah, that's what happens when the two meet, the elephant and the lion or the lionesses. Yeah, the lioness has to give way. Elephants are too big and they will take no joke with the lionesses. They will chase them away. That was really fun. You know, it was nice to share it with you to see you know, the reaction of the elephant. You know, that's the only one that picked up, you know, you can tell the others yeah, you know, you can tell, uh, that's, she's the only one that was concerned. I think she picked up either the smell and also the color was slightly different from the angle she was. So I'm sure she was 100% sure that those are lions. What is she thinking now, do you think, you know? Is she gonna, she's still gonna go for them? Is she gonna continue? I don't know. She's a mature female. And she knows uh, lions are enemies, so the best thing is to chase them away, get rid of them. There is a calf that's joining in, so usually calves are much more actually concerned and they'll join in the chase, but making sure that the mothers are very close. It's a young male. I don't know what he's going to do. Is he going to pick up the scent of the lions? That's where almost they were that area and then if she picks up the scent you can see you will see the reaction the ears will raise and she might run towards the mother i'm glad the lionesses picked up the elephant you know early enough because it could have gone you know really wrong it will take no chance the elephant uh, it will take no you know um chance you know it will just kill them if it got them you know sleeping where they were. So I'm glad that uh, the lioness has really picked up the elephant when she was coming. Yeah, did the little guy pick up the scent or is it something that's, yeah, it's picking up something using the leg now. Help approach it. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a young acacia. One more tree uprooted by this young male. We cannot see the lionesses now. They're in deep grass. I'm sure they are saying, you know, when will these elephants go so that we can sleep? Right now they cannot rest. They are, they are keeping watch for sure. Yes, you know, if anything else happens, uh, interesting, that if anything interesting happens, we'll share it with you. So, you know, stay tuned. So remember we were talking about those open areas earlier on. So we came to one of those open areas um, and there are three zebra right here. And those are of course my favorite animals. So we couldn't just drive past. We had to just stop and have a look. But you can see if you notice the tail, how the wind is blowing at the moment. You'll just see how the tail is being blown by the wind. Now they have moved into or just behind a bit of cover. What I want to do is there looks like there's a gap not too far from here. So if we get there, we might be able to get another glimpse of the zebra. Mm -hmm. We are going to get a better view. Hopefully they don't move off too quickly. So I'm going to stop right here. Here we go. Because if they carry on the way they're doing now, we might just lose them uh, behind those trees. But notice the brownish markings between the black and the white. So those are referred to as shadow stripes. Now what's quite amazing about zebras for me is that every single zebra has a different stripe pattern to the other one. It's like our fingerprints. So 
of that. So while we seeing these zebras moving and uh, eventually they are going to disappear. I just wanted to get back to a question from yesterday. So I think it was Jacqueline that was asking me why giraffes have black tongues. So I did a bit of research because with the wind sometimes like this, it's going to be really hard to see giraffes out in the open. They tend to move to denser areas to get out of the wind. Uh, but so there's no real con inclusive answer to that question of why they have black or bluish tongues but one of the theories is because they have a black or bluish tongue there's a lot of melanin in it so when they do stretch out their tongue to eat the leaves um, normally tongues are quite sensitive to sunlight and because of that it helps protect the tongue from the sunlight that's just there was a few articles I read regarding that um, but there's no no one knows exactly for sure but that's just one of the theories that they have Thank you, Nikki. Well, everybody, we have moved on from our jackal on the Juma. The jackal buried the other half of that scrub air underneath a little bush. He buried it, or she buried it in moments. It was quite something to behold. And then off he went to go have a drink. So we've moved off to go and have a scratch around on Simbumbili. And we're up on the open area here. We found a nice mixed herd of impala. And you guessed it, everybody, it is quiz time. Now, I know we've spoken at length about Impala. We've spoken at... Sorry. We've spoken about all sorts of things. And one of the things that always comes up in quizzes and is quite easy to discuss is gestation period, pregnancy. So everybody, it's a very important one down here in South Africa because um, the timing of the rutting season with the impalas is to basically accumulate or to have all the, the impala females giving birth at the same time. And that is when the summer or spring is here and there is rain and fresh vegetation. So what is the gestation period for the impala? Send through your answers to hashtag wild earth, hashtag CGTN wild. And it's a very important sort of timing because the males come into a cycle or the females come into a cycle. A very specific time of year in South Africa. It's different up in Kenya. Very specific time of year down here because we have such a seasonal sort of switch in diet or in a vegetation. Uh, condition. You see how dry it is now. There's almost no leaves on the trees. The grasses are quite dry. Vegetation is at its lowest from a nutrient point of view. And so females have a gestation period that will then carry them into a time when the vegetation is greener, tastier, more nutrient rich, and also provides a fair bit more cover for their lambs and uh, impala will basically flood the market when it comes to babies they'll all breed within two to three weeks of each other so suddenly you've just got hundreds of young baby impala hanging around in little nurseries and the benefits of that are that yes the youngsters are much more vulnerable to being attacked by animals like jackal we saw jackal will smash baby impalas leopard lion large eagles all sorts of predators including snakes will actually feed off of baby impala and the reason they flood the market is it makes it very difficult then for the predators to control the burst or surge of the impala population if you only have a few babies at a time it's very easy for the predators to build up their numbers and to remove more youngsters from the population so that mass breeding with so many babies at the same time is one of the most important adaptations that Impala have managed to do. Okay, welcome back guys. Um, the female that chased the lioness is the one to the right, the calf that followed is the one in the middle, and then that young you know, bull joined them. 
There is lots of them scattered everywhere. And I think we're going to go, you know, there's going to be round two of the lions being chased. Yeah, those are, looks like young two. Is it a bull to the left? And I think a female to the right. He's bullying, you know, he's bullying the young male, the young female. Oh, it's also a male. That's really cute. Sometimes that's how they greet each other, but that one wasn't a very good one. Usually they, um, like, cross-tangle the tusks, then wrap the trunks around one another. And usually it's a friendly gre greeting. That one wasn't very friendly. friendly. Yeah, the female that chased the lions is still heading farther. I don't know if it's going to happen again. They are almost 90 feet to the left. We cannot see them. We know where they are in the long grass, but it's going to happen again. This is a very healthy breeding herd. There is almost about 20 scattered everywhere. We'll be sharing the numbers with you, but let's see what this female is up to. Looks like she's hasn't you know, left the lionesses alone and she's following the scent really slowly. I'm sure the lionesses can hear her approaching and they will take off once they think she's broken that safety distance and the only option is to leave her alone definitely she's up to something uh, let's wait and see unless they move away she will continue following them at the same time there is something very yummy very you know delicious there that she's going for yeah, we're back to the two bulls, and yeah, that is, you know, now fighting, play fighting. These are, you know, plays that makes them become more experienced in fighting in the years to come. They use techniques that they're learning now. Also, when they fight at these ages, they will avoid conflicts in the years to come because they will remember that you know such and such beat me last time so there's no need now that we're 50 to fight again he'll still beat me so they're very important yeah okay i'm staying here i'm hoping that you know the same thing will happen and we'll share it with you Yeah, I mean, uh, Isaac stated that you may not know what uh, will happen and just wait and watch things unfold. Moved on, still chancing on a cheetah, but I got an ostrich for you instead. And this is the Maasai ostrich. And I'm sure you all know it is a female and not a male. There are certain birds, when we look at their sexual dimorphism, it's always very difficult. But for the ostriches are black and white. Females being brownish, grayish in color. And the males are black and white. In Kenya, we've got two species of these ostriches. We have another type north of the equator that is called the Somali ostrich. See how the wind is blowing her feathers as she feeds. They'll be picking some seeds from the grass. Grass blades. Sometimes some leaves or getting whole plants off the ground at the same time. Insects too, should I catch any insect or beetles, you know, not moving very fast. I'm going to see how busy she is feeding there. I've been watching her to find out if there could be a mate close by. And she's all alone enjoying this particular area. Thanks, David. Wonderful to see ostrich. We don't get to see them very often down here. 
They do occur, though. I've never seen one. I've only seen tracks. But we are with our impalas. The, the males at the moment, which have clearly got nothing to do with gestation period, the females are a little bit further off, a little bit more down the slope. Unfortunately, where we are is a good position for our signal. So, so we have some answers for the quiz, of course. Very excited to hear what you all came up with. Petro. Petro sounds like he's right on the money there. I wonder if anyone else has managed to get anywhere near Petro's answers before we blurt out the answer there. Is there any, any other answers to go with Petro's, who is 100% correct? Lisa, 195 to 200 days sounds about right. Um, I'm normally working it out in months. I think that's right though. So if you got anywhere in the region of 30 weeks, 200 days, or six and a half to seven months, then well done everybody. You have managed to guess the Impala's gestation period. Obviously, there is some talk of, um, I mean, it's quite a long period if you think about it for such a small animal. But when the impala lamb is born, it looks a bit shaky on its feet at first, but they're able to move very soon after birth. Very soon after birth, but with a little bit of cover, um, mum will give birth to them and uh, they'll hide them away in a little alcove, just hidden away from the female. And uh, how it's possible, I am not sure, but a baby impala have got absolutely no scent to them for the first little while after birth. So even a nosy hyena can't track them down. How, I don't know. How do you just not have a scent that is just, I don't know. I mean, maybe we couldn't smell it, but an animal like a hyena, you'd think, would be able to pick up on it. But they will sit very well hidden in the grass and mum will run away, attracting the predator's attention and the impala will escape detection that way. And after a period of time, all the little babies will be brought together into little nurseries, and that is so cute to see. Uh, in November, everybody, middle to late November, is when the impalas will be lambing. Um, sometimes maybe even into December. All depends on, on how the season worked this year. I completely missed it. I was away for the rutting season this year, but it seemed to be the right sort of time. Those impala are all very interested in something. I'm going to go have a look over there. Do you see them on the left? They're all very interested in something on the left. Let's go have a look. Okay, impalas are often quite a good indicator of a predator. They're looking in that direction. So let's go see if they've maybe found us one. and a very warm welcome to Ambion Pinda Private Game Reserve. We're here in the southern open areas of Pinda with a beautiful female cheetah. My name is Jared, we've got Craig behind the camera and what a great way to start a morning with one of the very special animals that we have here on Pinda. So like I said it is a female cheetah and um, she has been in this area for the last couple days. Copy? and most likely coming into this open area. It doesn't look like she's eaten too recently, so probably hoping uh, that a impala could be in this area for her to hunt. Uh, this area traditionally actually used to have quite a lot of reed buck, um, common reed buck, but over the years, the cheetah uh, that love this open area have unfortunately diminished the reed buck population and which was once a very good area for them to hunt reedbuck, common reedbuck. Now it is very rare to see a common reedbuck. Uh, but for now, it doesn't seem like she's interested in hunting at all. But something that you'll notice when you look at her, you'll see the grass blades. they kind of blowing over her at the moment. So what that means is that the wind is blowing left to right. And so this is a very typical cheetah sleeping position, facing downwind, looking for anything that could be downwind from her because obviously she can't smell what's downwind but she can see what is downwind and anything upwind she'll be able to smell or hear 
Uh, that being said, should really only be concerned about lions and leopards. Uh, probably not a leopard in this big open area. Um, more so lions, and then hopefully the opportunity for to hunt. Now you also notice, which is quite different to how she's sleeping at the moment, compared to lions and leopards who would sleep with their head down on the ground. Have a look how she's busy sleeping with her chin rested on her shoulder. Now th there's quite a few reasons for this. Because she can never fully rest like a lion would, who can just sleep for hours and end, she has to be very aware. Now what we might see her do every minute or two is just open up her eyes, look around, and then go back to sleep again. And then another 30 seconds, minute, two minutes, look around, go back to sleep again. And if she had to drop her head down and up and down and up every single time she did that, that is just a waste of energy. And so Cheetah have just found that this is the best way to sleep. It's comfortable with the head on the shoulder. It's energy efficient. And she just has to open up, look, okay, nothing coming towards me. And then going back down to sleep again. So I believe there were some discussions and a quiz earlier about gestation periods and I'd be interested to hear from the viewers back home if any of you know what is the gestation period of a cheetah. So Gemma, that's a, a good question. So Pinda does most certainly have a very good population of cheetah. Now, Pinda in fact has been one of the reserves who has populated cheetah all throughout South Africa. So because we have a very healthy population of cheetah and they do very well here because of our big open areas and the amount of food that's here, we often end up having an overpopulation of cheetah. So we very seldom actually ever need to bring cheetah to Pinda, it is more the other way around. Most reserves in South Africa actually get their cheetah from Pinda. Unfortunately, we our cheetah numbers have dropped dramatically over uh, the last couple of years. There's quite a, a, a few reasons for that. An increase in hyena population, an increase in leopard population, and the ever-present uh, lions that are around. And we have unfortunately lost quite a few cheetah. When I started working here seven years ago, I think we had around 35 to 40 cheetah on Pinda, which is an incredible amount. Um, in the beginning of this year, we only had six adult breeding females. This was She wasn't regarded as one of them, this one that we've got here, because she has recently become independent. Um, but six adult breeding females is not good enough. So we have in fact actually brought in a, one new female cheetah this year, and hopefully she's going to be successful and, and breed, and we will be able to get our numbers back up to what they used to be, and we can start populating uh, other reserves in South Africa. Uh, what we do have to do is, because Pinda is a fenced-in reserve, it's, it's, it's around 28,000 hectares, and we, we have to worry that there is um, when interbreeding with the males and females. So we don't want males to breed with their daughters and their granddaughters. So what we will do is every four years or so, we will take a male or two males from Pinda and send it to another reserve, and then often that reserve will give us one or two male cheetah. So recently we, we did uh, send two of the male cheetahs to a neighboring reserve and, and we, we received two new cheetahs and this was about two months ago. And we have also received one more young male cheetah. So this year we have received four new cheetah uh, but before that it's actually quite a long time before we had received any new cheetah. So very good question. I hope that you're all rolling in the answers for what is the gestation period of a cheetah. It is a short gestation period. Um, I will get to it now. Um, but one of the reasons that they have a very short gestation period, and you'll notice when you do look up the gestation period that it is shorter than lions and leopards, and it is because a cheetah is very vulnerable. So they don't want to stay pregnant for very long. And obviously if they're pregnant, they're heavy, they're slower, it's more difficult to hunt, it's more difficult to get away from predators. And cheetahs can have high litters. We have a female cheetah in the north of the reserve, which is um, a bit of a distance from where we are now, who has six cubs. So you can imagine a female cheetah with six cubs inside of her would be very slow if she had a, a very long gestation period. Well done, Jared, and I think you've made my job easier having spotted a cheetah for all of us. 
and that gives me a breather and maybe not work as hard as before looking for a cheetah and I'll concentrate now on some other animal species. These are the southern ground hornbills. The largest hornbills we have in Africa. And we call them ground hornbills because they spend most of their time on the ground feeding because they don't have anything to catch on top of trees. So the better part of the day, they'll be out just browsing through the grass, putting the feathers in shape. And my guess is a male and a female. And it's truly wonderful to see ground horn beagles. Great comments to hear from you. And the more comments you send or questions, we are always very happy to hear from you. You can tweet us as usual, hashtag CGTN World or hashtag World Earth. Now, there's been a bit of concern on these uh, hornbills uh, currently on their status because their numbers have been dramatically going down. Not that people will hunt them, but there have been a bit of concern on logging going on in uh, certain parts of Africa. And for that reason, they are losing their habitat to breed. After mating, the female will always look for huge trees that are hollow, and that's where they normally lay their eggs. Very solid, big and old trees. And unfortunately, when people will go for the same trees uh, for food fuel or for furniture making, it's becoming a concern. Very difficult for them, you know, to raise their young ones and the young ones remain with the parents for such a long time, and that's the other concern for their numbers not going up. Strong beaks they got, very sharp. Anna Marie, I would want to tell you, looking at IUCN currently, they think we are getting somewhere, Anna Marie, not as it was five years ago. And what's happening now, Anna Marie, uh, we are getting governments and other, I would say, conservation bodies and enlightening the locals and telling them, we need these birds, we need them in the ecosystem because they got their role in the whole cycle. So I would say not as bad as it was, and I'd be happy to get the latest uh, IUCN, IUCN uh, filling or status of these particular hornbills. She must have gotten something there for herself. And sometimes they just push the beaks right through the grass or the ground. I was saying earlier, they're very sharp and very strong. They're just like chisels. If they get a terrapin there or even a tortoise, like a leopard tortoise, You'll be surprised. They just poke through their beaks in the shell and it just opens up and they just get the flesh in. The times we see big numbers together, but for now we have these two that will wish them luck on the feeding. All right, so for those of you who haven't got your answers in yet, please do get your answers in to see if you can find out or figure out what is the gestation period of a female cheetah. And I spent the <laughs> last time explaining to you how cheetahs don't often put their heads down. And there she is, head down flat. <laughs> Typical. So Suzette, you say three months? Yeah, that's, that's about right. So you, about 90 days or so uh, is the gestation period of a female cheetah role done Suzette, and I'm sure there are many many more of you who got the correct answers and You will see that that is slightly less than uh, the rest which uh, leopards are around 100 days lions are 110 days Lisa and Marie, I believe you got 90 days as well. Well done uh, Three months is correct, but uh, 90 days is even a little bit more correct <laughs> You buy what's that one or two days, and obviously, it's not exactly 90 days, it'll be uh, plus minus. Um, some books will say between 85 to 90 days, but now she's done exactly what I said. She 
may not do is put her head down and that would then tell you that she's completely comfortable in her area she's been here for potentially all morning when we arrived and uh, we found her um, she was sleeping in this exact same spot and if she's been here for the last two or three hours she's probably decided with the strong breeze coming from left to right and the large open area that she hasn't smelt seen or heard any predators in the area so now she's a little bit more comfortable to lie completely flat you might find though that she could just jump up uh, erratically and and that could be even though she is resting she still has to be very aware of her surroundings and when it's very windy like this they do tend to be a little bit more edgy and if there's a gust of wind that blows and all of a sudden a branch or grass blows over each other it sounds like something's coming up from behind her she may jump up uh, but for now she seems more than relaxed only a little bit irritated by those flies that seem to be landing on her ear you'll see her ear flicking from time to time but as she lies down you'll see that ear is still facing right up just like a satellite dish to be able to hear any predators in the area so as i mentioned earlier she is a younger female and um, recently become independent so hasn't had cubs yet uh, but she is at the age now that i'm sure if she hasn't already mated um, she most certainly will mate within the next couple of weeks if she is able to find a male cheetah we were talking about the amount of cheetah that we have on pinder at the moment and male cheetahs have quite a big territory so if this female was in estrus she would ha actively have to go out and seek the males and unlike lions and leopards who roar and and saw and rasp very loudly which can be heard from a long distance away uh, cheetahs unfortunately don't have the ability to give off this big sound like lions can so generally what they would do is they'll just have to walk around hopefully pick up on the scent of a male that has walked in the area and then track him down if they are close by they do give off these uh, whistles um, which if the male was to be close by he would hear them but they do have to be very careful at that stage because they would then alert any predators in the area that they are around Welcome back to Simbumbili Private Game Reserve, everybody, where we've got much larger antelope this time in the form of kudu. Now, talking about the gestation period before the impala versus that of the cheetah, now, it's quite, quite amazing, isn't it, that the impala that is probably a little bit lighter than a cheetah has got double the gestation period. Double the gestation period of that of a cheetah, and that's because antelope species, when they're born, need to be able to move and keep up with the herd and run for their own safety. Whereas uh, predators generally give birth to much less developed youngsters, which they need to hide away somewhere. Um, it's one of the reasons why predators also have quite a low success rate with regards to rearing their youngsters, cheetahs specifically, because there's so much competition out there, so many animals that will kill cheetah as well as their cubs. So prey animals give birth to animal to youngsters that are able to move quite soon. And we call that precocial, meaning a little bit more developed. Whereas predators give birth to altricial youngsters, which require enormous amount of parental care in the early months of their life. Also, cheetah need to be able to run, as well as leopard and lion, need to be able to be active and agile to catch their prey. So having bigger babies in the belly would make that difficult. But these herbivores, not these male kudu of course, but herbivores are willing to go the extra mile with their youngsters to be able to produce them at a much further developed stage. But it's also what makes pregnant animals, pregnant herbivore animals, a little bit easier targets. And as the season starts to wear on with impalas, you're going to see more and more female in parlors being targeted by predators because they're a little bit more cumbersome, not as agile as the males. But to this wonderful bachelor group of kudu is just something to behold, isn't it? So wonderful to see groups of kudu with magnificent horns. You can tell how windy it is by the mane on the back of their neck there. Kudu are an animal that enjoys the woodland. 
They don't often move out into the open areas like this, but because it's so windy, these kudu do not want to be surprised by any predator. So they're willing to go out into the open and to have a little bit of a tussle, the two on the right. Everyone's saying they love the horns. They're so elegant, aren't they? Kudu are definitely one of my favorite antelope. And those horns are designed exclusively for fighting everybody. I've never seen a never seen a kudu turn on a predator. You might hear an elephant screaming in the distance. Someone's having a temper tantrum. But everybody, we're standing by here in this open area because um, there are wild dogs moving around from elephant plains towards this area and everybody who is with them has lost them. So we might be very lucky and sit in this area and have wild dogs come to us. Your Steve is hoping for some wild dogs. That is very, very lucky. Good luck there, Steve. And uh, he's looking for a extremely endangered animal. And we are very fortunate here that we're able to find on Pinda a very endangered animal. And as mentioned earlier, unfortunately for them, they are endangered because they are so vulnerable to being killed by other predators. So, unfortunately for cheetah, they lack the strength in their jaw and their body that a lion, hyena or leopard would have. So Pranav, you're asking why don't cheetahs hoist their kills? So I'm sure Pranav, you know that cheetahs are extremely fast. So to become fast as they do, they need to be very streamlined. They need to have very long legs and their claws need to always be out. Whereas a leopard who does hoist their kills is designed for a, a very quick um, acceleration. They designed to climb tr trees and therefore being able to hoist kills into trees. So a leopard couldn't be as fast as a cheetah because of the way that a leopard is designed and a leopard is designed to be able to climb trees. A cheetah cannot hoist a kill into the tree because the way that they have been designed unfortunately doesn't allow them to be strong because if you were strong you can't be fast. And with cheetahs being in open areas, they had to sacrifice the strength that lions and leopards would have that can climb into trees and um, instead have the, com the perfect body shape, the, the long claws, the long legs, the skinny body, uh, the big um, lungs, the rigid spine, which then makes it a little bit more tricky to hoist a kill into a tree. That doesn't mean they can't climb trees. A cheetah can climb a tree. They do climb it with great difficulty and they would generally climb into a tree that isn't too tall or at least to the first V in the tree too high or if the tree's at a bit of an angle. Um, but cheetahs do struggle to drag carcasses. If they do kill something small or medium, they will try and drag it into a thicket. But when you actually see them do that, it would be very, very difficult. And to climb a tree then is just impossible for them with their kill. But while we're on that talking about cheetahs and leopards, I think let's learn a little bit about what is the difference between a cheetah and a leopard. The ultimate triple threat versus an iconic specialist. One built for stealth, power and ambush. The other designed for speed. The cheetah decorated with black spots. The leopard with copper rosettes. The leopard, a stalking cat of the woodlands. The cheetah, a coursing cat of the plains. Cheetahs are built exclusively for speed and lack the strength to stash their kills or fight off scavengers.
while leopards are strong and agile enough to hoist their kills away from thieving lions and hyenas. And while leopards live alone, cheetah often find comfort in the company and protection of siblings. Each cat is the master of their domain and holds a spot atop the African food chain. The more you watch this live safari, the more you will actually be able to tell the difference and identify the difference between leopards and cheetahs very, very easily. Their similarities tell you that having that kind of color, having spotted patterns, whether it's rosettes or spots, plain spots, works well in the bush as a predator. And these guys here, these impalas, they often get taken by leopards. Probably the favorite, them and dikers, amongst the favorite, favorite food source for leopards. Now we do get cheetah on Juma as well. It's just a very rare occurrence because as you learned, cheetah like open grassland. They need to be able to run. And if they're sharp, thorny sticks all over the place, they can hurt themselves very, very badly if they get snagged on one of those with the speed at which they run. It can be quite crazy, but sometimes we do get lucky. Anyway, guys, I'm going to move on from these Impala. And do remember, you're watching CGTN's Digital Safari, so chat to us using the hashtag CGTNWild or hashtag WildEarth. Welcome back to the river. I have left my elephants and my lions in the long grass. And just to contribute, yes, cheetahs can be very weak in defending their kills. I have seen many times where a big flock of vultures land and they intimidate them and they just leave the kill. On that note, um, this is a very different section of the river. I haven't shared this area very much with you and the residents here looks like don't have issues they are they have decided to share the beach together yes and more are coming out it's a good pod of hippos and some monster crocodiles huge 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 ones i must say the current is slightly stronger today and, I th and so I think it is not very comfortable for anybody to be in the water. That's why, you know, they are going out. Don't worry, he's on the other side of the crocodile, so he's not going to bother the crocodile. And the cro uh, crocodile is not as bothered as you can see. There is another croc in between the two hippos. You see him, he's quite a huge one. Also, very far out, almost maybe three meters out of water. And here looks like there is no worries at all. Remember, this is life. It's happening now from the beautiful Masai Mara in East Africa, Kenya. Dan Seb, you ask if a crocodile will take a young hippo? Yes, it can. It can take. If the little guy is left unattended, for sure, it will take it. But it is not a priority when the big hippos are around. They will, you know, avoid doing that when the adult hippos are there. But definitely, if left unattended, crocodiles will take the little guys. This time of the year, I have seen lots of lots of young ones almost a month, a month and a half, two months. And so in the near future, we can say that, you know, this is a good month to see lots of young ones. Yeah, the months 
of you know August, July, August, September could be good months to see lots of young ones. This is a different pod, like I said. The other one had five, you know, little way young ones. Here I see about three, and there could be more. Yeah. Oh, what's happening there? Yeah, there's lots of action in this pool. Yeah, is that crocodile gonna bother that? That hippo gonna bother that crocodile? No. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna be here. This is really cool, guys. Talk to me, hashtag Wild Earths, hashtag CGTN Wild. That's where you can get me questions. Yeah, and comments. We have a bearded woodpecker. Woodpecker in the morning. See quite bold black and white markings there. It's also quite a large woodpecker. It's about 80 grams. It's the biggest one we get here. So it's easy to identify. They also make quite a loud sound when they pick. The loudest of all the woodpeckers we get here. This looks like a female. The males have a red crown on their head. You can see it's struggling a little bit in the wind. You can see the arms of that marula swinging in the background in the wind. It has picked up quite a bit, so you may not be able to hear it actually knocking against the bark. But I love a woodpecker in the morning. Now, I am hoping and I was so close yesterday to get all four woodpeckers that we get here in one drive. That would be the bearded, the bennets, the cardinal, and the golden tailed. I want to get them in one drive. And in the Mulwati, it's been pretty good. Yesterday I saw a bennets, a cardinal, and uh, a bearded woodpecker. And I was just thought, oh, one golden tail, but didn't count because you didn't see them with me. So that's what I want. I want to find all of them in one drive. I think that would be awesome. Tammy, you'd like to know if they ever get headaches? Well, I, I'm sure they do to some extent. Of course, it's very difficult to assess that kind of thing. But they, even though they may look like a jackhammer as they strike their their beaks and therefore their heads into that bark they have an excellent shock absorber that actually goes around their brain actually around the case so that when they're hitting constantly hitting against this bark that force doesn't get transferred to the head so they have a very long tongue that they use to push in between the bark and pick up grubs and that muscle of the tongue extends into and behind the head and around so it creates this cushioning and a shock absorber so the headaches that you may associate with constantly banging your head against a marula tree is not something they would have to deal with in theory but like I said it's difficult to test whether a woodpecker whose brain is probably the size of a walnut, if not a little smaller, will experience a headache. But certainly they have preventative measures so they don't have any sort of brain damage. How's this for a scene? Zebras, wildebeest and quite a few giraffes. Um, and we were talking about them early on today. Have a look at this youngster uh, crossing the road. Now, how I know it's a youngster is if you look at the very tip of the horns, it's still quite fluffy. Now, it's not a young baby, but still, it's also not a fully grown adult. It looks like my hair when I wake up in the morning. But what I do enjoy about them is how elegantly they move. Look at how the left side moves, and then the right, and then the left. Now there's a few, now just closer towards us and slightly right, there's actually a big male that's really dark in color. 
So here he is. And it has to do a lot with the lighting on it, but if we zoom in closely, you'll notice it's really dark in comparison to most of the giraffes that we've been seeing over the last little while. Just look at how dark that pattern is. Notice that ox picker just under his throat. Now I'd like to know from the viewers, how do we know, just by looking at the head, that it would be a male or possibly even a female? So what it's doing at the moment, as you can see, it's not feeding off everything. So yesterday when we had um, some elephant droppings and some giraffe droppings, we compared the two. So they, what this giraffe is doing is ruminating. So it's fed off quite a bit of um, leaf material this morning and, uh, or during the evening. And now it's bringing it up, chewing it, swallowing it, allowing it to just break down a bit more and then bringing it up again and chewing it just so that it, um, they're able to digest it better. So very similar to what you find in a cow, which has that four-chamber stomach. And this is similar with that of giraffes. Now, as we mentioned, there's quite a few giraffes. Now, I just want to show you more or less the scene that we are looking at. So there is a giraffe coming in from the right. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven giraffes. Quite a few zebra. And then the wildebeest in the back. There's a giraffe coming in from the right. Mrs. Zero, you are 100% right. The males have on the, oh, the ossicons, those horns, they are bald and the females have tufts of hair on top of their horns. Because with the males, they have that behavior known as necking, where they cross their um, necks and then they hit each other with the very tip of their horns as they swing their, their neck and their head. But quite a special scene. What I want to do, though, is with the giraffes moving off, let's move slightly closer so we can get the sun uh, at a nice angle and see if we can get a better glimpse of what's happening around us here. I'm just going to slowly ease forward. just want to stop here. Here we go. Have a look at this. And often, especially with giraffe, zebra, even wildebeest, you do find them together in an area because of that safety and numbers. And what better animal to have around with a giraffe with such a nice vantage point to scan and look out for any potential danger. Even those lines that we saw this morning, it's not too far from here, not even as the crow flies, not even a kilometer away. So if these giraffes would have seen the line, probably in the tall grass moving closer, it immediately warned these other animals. And you don't really hear them making a very prominent alarm call that's more like this very deep snort that they'll give to warn the other animals. Hello, hello, and welcome back. I'm still here at the river. I don't know if you can hear the sound on the roar of the river. It's really calming. And that is a pod of hippos across there. Look at that little guy, you know, he's actually putting his head above the crocodile. See that, guys? Wow, be careful, you might be dinner. He's really investigating this crocodile, this young hippo. I don't know what, maybe this is the best chance for the little guy to really experience. Is he chewing the back? Ha, huh. get away, it's my toy. 
or not. Is he gonna lie down also? Ah, looks like he's very tired. He wants to sleep. Inter inter <laughs> That's interesting. He just pushed the crocodile's tail with his, you know, back. Yeah, that's uh, rather the interesting behavior. I think the crocodile knows that there's no chance for him to try and, you know, touch that little guy. And the hippos are comfortable with him being there because he's not showing any signs. Wilson Justin, you ask if they eat humans, crocodiles? Of course, they do. Yeah, every year they do claim lives. It's not a very significant number to be noticed, but you know, being here in the bush, they do, they do um, kill people. Yeah, mistakenly, mistakenly, you know, when you come crossing or you know, swimming, fetching water, they do grab people. Look at that, guys. We have arrivals at the river. Those are zebras and they are coming towards the crossing. I don't know if we have one soon or not, but it is a very good sign. Like I told you before, they were not very far. Actually, there is one that we missed out. We didn't see him. He's very close. I said, you know, they're very close. And if you look behind, uh, um, James, could you hold that frame? If you look way behind, uh, there is a lone tree. And those little spots there, those are not rocks or bushes. Those are wildebeest, and those are the ones that I could see earlier. And so it looks like this is the beginning of the next, you know, beautiful days by the river. It's going to change. So, guys, you know, I won't say anything. I won't get very excited. Just sit there. If something happens, we'll share it with you. So as the sun's starting to rise, it is obviously getting a little bit hotter. And this female has got up and lain in the very thick long grass, which serves two purposes. One, it would help hide her from anything in the area. But two, it is allowing her to be able to get into the shade that that grass is casting over her. And every now and then we see her lift her head up and then she plonks it back down. So it's obviously telling us that she is most certainly very relaxed to be here. It's quite amazing that this, so this female leopard, she was a uh, cheetah, sorry, not leopard. This female cheetah, she was born in the far north of the reserve. And after she became independent, she came all the way to the south. And it is, it always amazes me how these cheetahs are able to find all these open areas when they've never been here before. And she pretty much came straight here from the south. So you don't know, always wonder if they don't smell old ancient uh, pathways that the the rest of the cheetahs have all followed or or maybe once her mother did come back south and then went back to the north of the reserve and she just remembered that this was a very good area that was nice and open. It's very difficult to say. But watching them move around does always fascinate me that they always seem to know exactly where to go from one open area to the other. But she is doing a very good job at hiding from us. When I look at all the babies of the animals in the African bushes, I think elephant's calves to me are my favorite. Now, look at that young calf there. She is on her own and she's having a world for herself. Not sure exactly what she's doing or even she knows what she's doing, but you can tell she's having fun. I'm trying to compare sometimes like cheetahs, cheetah cups with Jared and, you know, comparing all other babies that we see here every other day. Elephant cows make me happy, especially when they get in that really uh, playful mood. Look at, the, look at her. Boom. So what does that mean? 
because suddenly she is not feeding, but she, chances are she is full and one of the females or one of the cows here is the mother. But the whole idea, I'm happy, I know I got all the protection I need, I'll have a nap, I'll have my trunk up, rise up and shine. I'm sure she's not struggling to rise up. Most likely the cow there could be the mother. <laughs> it's so funny how she is uh, just having fun for herself uh, on an early morning here. Keeping flapping her ears. Not because it's very warm at the moment, but I think she sees maybe the others doing the same and flapping one ear, not the other. In the background, we can hear some hippos growling. Now, every small herd of elephants you will see like this will have a leader. We all know elephants are very matriarchal. There's another young one I've seen here, and I'm trying to imagine if both of them are going to join hands, it's going to be a very good uh, uh, playtime here. So it's a big one here. If you look on the right task, it's much shorter than the other. Are you trying too much? That one? No, you're too young. Looks like a bull from a distance. We'll be finding out. Maybe it could be a big cow at the same time. She could be just a big female. And it's not always by size that you determine the matriarch. Sometimes it's uh, the oldest cow that could be in charge. Awesome, Justin. The lifespan of an African elephant is about 65 years. That's the average. 65 years, we have what we call the savanna elephants, like what you're seeing here. And you've got another subspecies that we call the forest elephant. But they got a lifespan of about 65 years. Of course, a few may go a little bit more than that. And some could go 50, 55. But we normally average them to 65 years. Now, that must be either a big sister or a big brother in which she is uh, playing with, or an auntie. And she is not going close to the one that I thought they're going to go play with. So just wait here and see if the two calves will come together and hopefully see more fun from them. Just try to reposition the vehicle a bit to have the sun behind us um, so we can have a better look at these zebras and giraffes. Now, what could be a nice comparison is, remember earlier on we said that one giraffe um, is a lot darker in color in comparison to the other. So now if we move a bit closer, have a look at the difference in color. You'll notice a lot darker. And so it's not always the case that the males tend to be darker than the females or the females darker than the males because I have seen it um, vice versa where some females are darker than the males, other males are darker than the females. But what I tend to notice is that sometimes the older a giraffe gets, the darker in color. And it looks like it might be quite an old giraffe, but also with his pigment, he has a very dark pigment. Most of them just ruminating. You can see the zebras, they pointing in opposite directions. Like you watch my back, I watch your back. Just now and again you'll see the zebras just flicking and tail. And what they might be doing is they just rest up. It does look like the one zebra is pregnant for most of our viewers. Not too, like early on we were driving past the one and the belly was so big. It was actually swaying from... Uh, the left to the right, and might be. Imagine in the next little while we can have a little baby zebra around. Because if you compare that belly, look at how round it is. And I'm sure it won't be just from the food. You can even see how the, the back has that saddle in it as well. Because of how it's pulling it down. But what a scene. Wildebeest, zebra, there's actually a few zebra off to the right um, that are now slowly 
heading across towards where the giraffes are. Hmm. And then some wildebeest just right of that. Now what I often enjoy about a scene like this is that when you sit and just watch the different behavior, you'll notice that the wildebeest will have their heads down feeding off the short grass. The zebra often feeds off the taller grass, but then eventually as it starts warming up, you'll often find them with their heads on top of each other's backs or moving their bums closer towards one another, uh, but still facing opposite directions to see if there's any danger. And then sometimes even find them with the giraffes. Well, talking of all the food available and especially talking about the zebra maybe being pregnant and looking at the gestation period of zebras, comparing them to what we have for you here, the elephants, you'd imagine uh, the zebras will have gestation periods of about 12 or 13 months, uh, depending on the species of the zebra. But you'd imagine these elephants will have almost twice uh, that lifespan or rather that gestation period of carrying a baby 22 months. So do you imagine if that's the mother of the cow, uh, the mother of that particular calf there, she was carrying it for such a long time, 22 months. And that's why sometimes you see female elephants being very attached to their calves and staying very close to them. And they'll do anything possible to protect them. Now she's still continuing to have some fun on her own. And she hasn't joined. The other one is talking about is what you see near the bushes, though she looks much older or much bigger than the other one to the left there. And they haven't joined together to start the play. I'm still hoping they're going to come together at one point. We have some boo boots drinking at Twin Dams here. So interesting to watch them. The wind has become ridiculous. My cap is blowing off my head. But these baboons don't seem to care too much. What have you found there that you're eating? Now it's nice to see a troop because so often the only times we see them, or rather all we see is their leftovers, what they've done to the place. Oh, it is very, very windy, guys. I'm gonna try and get into the Mowati. Maybe it'll be a little bit more pleasant. Have a look at these two stallions, how they are having a little tussle with one another. See, they often will go and try and bite each other's legs, and then once that happens, they'll go onto their knees and fight each other. So this has been going on now for the last two minutes, and it just doesn't look like they want to stop. See, the, hopefully I didn't jinx it. Have you noticed that with all of them, they're standing quite close to each other's tails, so that's in order to help any flies, um, to chase off any flies that are around their face. It looks like they've settled down now, but they were just having a little go at one another, probably just to establish that dominance amongst that um, group there. Could be that all of them are young males or stallions together, but I'm not too sure, it's hard to tell from here if they're males or females. But it does look like there's a giraffe just left of them that is trying to pick something off the ground. It was one of the little ones, but he immediately picked up his head now. I think he just probably had a scratch on its leg. Oh, there it is. Like, just picked up the back foot. Probably has an itch just underneath, trying to get to that itch. Just have a look at those two zebras again. 
they are now facing this way. Now I'm hoping, well, I don't want to hope it, but imagine if they do start um, interacting again to be able to see that interaction. Bernice, I'll have to have a look um, and to see which zebras are um, in the Mara or, or which ones have been shown. But with these ones, there are quite a bit of like this uh, reddish soil in the area. And so, But the, just to give you an idea, so these ones are called the Birchels or the Plain Zebra. So I'd like to know uh, from any of our guides up in the Mara which zebras they are currently looking at. But if they are looking at similar ones to these, that dirty wash could be because of the soil that they've gone and rolled down in. Seems to me the one zebra has lost a bit of interest and now he's moving away from that group. And there's two other zebras that are here. Remember the ones that we that look pregnant. So he's on his way to come and meet up with these ones. So this one is a female, but that one off to the left definitely looks like she might be pregnant. We'll see now, especially if he joins up, if they turn a little bit, maybe we can see from the side how big that belly would be. So apparently, hearing from the, some of our viewers as well as some of the rangers, that we do have the same zebra, the same zebra was looked at, and uh, most of the viewers actually giving us the answer. So there's the plains, all the virtual zebra. So uh, the only reason why this would be like this is because of the soil that they would have gone and rolled down in. Sometimes they have these external parasites. Um, in order to get rid of it, they'll go and roll down in wood ash or possibly even in um, sand. And that could be the result of it. There are some zebras here that are a lot lighter in color, but also notice the dark shadow stripes that you find in these ones as well. So that all contributes to that darker appearance. Now, for our viewers, I don't know if the viewers, or I'm sure most of the viewers would probably know this, but um, in order to see if it's a male or female uh, zebra, you don't always have to look um, in between the legs. So sometimes what you can do is you look at the base of the tail. So with the females, they have a very broad uh, black stripe that runs from the base of the tail all the way underneath towards their belly, where the male has a very thin black line. So we can't see that now, but if we do get another opportunity, we'll definitely have a look and try and point it out. Welcome back to Simbambili, everybody. Here we've got wonderful little group of elephants, elephant bulls, just chilling at the watering hole. The wind is now just suddenly picked up. It's very easy to tell an elephant bull from an elephant cow. The individual in the middle there is a testament to it. One is a trunk and one is not. They are also far bigger than the females. And this is a common practice to see groups of males hanging out together. They sort of move off in groups. You know, often find a large bull with a group of younger bulls learning the ropes with regards to elephant dynamics. And we call that an Ascari. Ascari. These guys, apart from one that we can't see, who's basically on the right, on the far side on the right behind, and one on the right, you can just see his trunk sticking out. He's the smallest one. Now to the right, a little bit more, Theo. There you can see there's two trunks there on the right. There's one at the back. He's a little bit smaller. 
They can't even see him. So these guys, we actually found them on our way through earlier. They were busy feeding, very relaxed. Elephant bulls are always very chilled, especially when they're in the company of other bulls because there's a sort of like an ego game to be played. Uh, none of them want to be scared of anything. They're all big, strong males, you see, so their behavior doesn't really even change. Um, on foot, big elephant bulls can be the best, best things to have because they, they're not really frightened of anything and their behavior doesn't change. They pretend to be very, very cool and uh, they might see people on foot and they'll just, or a car even, and they'll just slightly change the angle they move without really reacting, especially if other bulls are watching. They don't want to feel as if they've been outplayed by anybody. They don't want to cause any drama. Very relaxed for the most part. Nothing at all bothers an elephant bull. So we've counted seven. Seven, and they've just been taking it easy. Some of them had their trunks just sitting in the water. But uh, elephants can actually sleep like this on their feet. They're very big animals, so they put a lot of pressure on their lungs when they lie down. So they'll either lean against something, or you might see them actually just sort of parking off just like this, standing, having a little bit of a rest. A bit of tail movement and ears moving now. It's almost as if they might be waking up again. There we go. I've been thinking about that drink for about 20 minutes. It's very, very relaxing, everybody. Elephants, even if they're not doing much, they're just standing there. It's still very peaceful and relaxing to, to spend time. And uh, if we were on foot and you saw these elephants from a distance on a watering hole like this, you could sort of walk to the other side and just sort of sit down the water between you. Elephants probably wouldn't even change their behavior at all. You'd be able to just sit there and watch them do exactly what they do best. Let us just be calm and serene in the moment. They're very, very slow. There's no rush in their moments. They know that all they've got to do today is have something to drink, eat, and take it easy. Good old classic cheetah. She was just sitting up and <laughs> maybe a second before you guys came to me, she decided to lie her head flat to the ground. So she did lift her head up. She, she glanced around as, as she would do when she's lying in a thicket like that. She can't, um, as, we, as we mentioned earlier, they'll often lie with their head on their shoulder and just glance around. But now that she's moved into a thicket, she can't really see what's around her. And so she just sat up and looked around. There is a herd of wildebeest off in the distance, maybe about 200, 300 meters from where we are now. And um, I think Craig's just trying to find them. There they are. So there's a large herd of wildebeest. You'll see that there's some white things amongst those wildebeest. That is a bird. Alice, which animal sleeps the longest in the animal kingdom? I'm actually not really sure. So lions, if we talk about what's around here, lions tend to sleep quite a bit. I mean, a lion can, can rest for about 20 hours of the day. Um, but to be honest with you, which animals sleep the longest in the animal kingdom? Probably a student at university. <laughs> I think that they <laughs> tend to sleep quite a bit. No, that was a bit of tongue-in-cheek. But unfortunately, Alice, I, I'm not sure of that question. I don't know if any of you back home know the answer to it, but I unfortunately don't. So as I was mentioning, amongst those birds, there, amongst those wildebeest, there was a bird or two. There's a cattle egret, and they were those white things that have now landed on the ground that you can't see. And they'll be eating any insects that the wildebeest flush up while they walk around. Now this female did have a brief look at this wildebeest, uh, but typically female cheetahs don't hunt wildebeest. 
uh, you'll probably find males and particularly collisions of males so two or more male cheetah who are together would hunt a medium-sized wildebeest to a calf if a female cheetah was to see a newborn calf there we go you see the category fly up there uh, a female cheetah might try hunt a newborn but we don't see any youngsters there all the youngsters there look like they're probably over a year now or just under a year so a little bit out of that the range for her and she would even face trouble from the male that would be in that herd if she was to try kill a youngster the male could see it's a female and small and maybe even try and defend that youngster so it's not worth the risk and she's not starving so for now I'd rather just go back to sleep and wait for a better opportunity to hunt All right, so FC has answered the question of the longest sleeping animal. Thank you very much, FC. And that is a koala with 22 hours, which is absolutely ridiculous, which means they literally only move and eat for two hours of the day. That sounds like quite a fantastic day. Thank goodness for koalas that there are not too many predators where they live in Australia, because otherwise they would be very vulnerable. Even a cheetah would probably climb into a tree to catch a sleeping koala. And uh, that's why there's no big cats in Australia, I guess. Otherwise the koalas wouldn't exist anymore. Doesn't sound like such a bad life. Welcome back to the river, guys. And yeah. All you know, hippos, crocodiles have become, and there's no issues here. The only thing here is find your space and sleep. And that is what is happening. This is this part of hippos is very very sleepy as I can say. And just to share with you, we have a few zebras that were trickling down. And looks like the leader is off to the left and the rest have stopped a distance away. Maybe they had an issue or some sort of experience going across the other side and so coming back they have to be very weary i must say i would be very wary because also the river is slightly higher as you can hear it's like it's very loud unlike yesterday and the previous day that guy was the leader he came all the way almost 10 feet to the bank and then i think he started thinking is it really clever for me to be the leader today um, am I gonna make it? No, he's, there's lots of things going on in his, in, in, in his mind. Um, maybe a friend. JM, you ask, you know, how long they can stay, crocodiles can stay out of water. They are cold-blooded and they need, uh, you know, the sun to thermoregulate their body temperatures to be able to digest and also to swim faster. I have seen them, you know, staying in the water in a nice uh, wooded area without extreme sunlight for almost the whole day. Over here with this extreme sunlight and direct sunlight like this, I doubt if they'll stay here the whole day. Most mornings they'll be out and then the afternoon they go in. So it differs as soon as they feel like the temperatures have gone to uh, increase to where they really want them they go back into the water or a shady part of the river but it's not it's not well defined how long they can stay out of water i hope you know that's uh, you know um, i've answered your question yes over here these guys here um they've been in the sun for most of the morning and if anything was to go into the water, they would be very fast swimmers now that, you know, their blood, you know, temperature has increased.
Can you see what I see? They are so, so well camouflaged. So well camouflaged, especially amongst this magic quarry and its mottled kind of branches with a bit of lichen on there. Have you seen them yet? They're a pair of spotted eagle owls. Here is one. Looking at us, actually. And here is another. That is incredible camouflage. You see how well that lichen works for them and the fact that their feathers are also spotted. Hence, spotted eagle owl. It works so, so well for them. Notice again that we spoke about protecting their eyes from the light and the fact that their pupils can't constrict in the same way ours can. And the one that's in the shade has its eyes open quite happily, but the one there closer to the ground, her eyes or his eyes are quite closed. Now, even though they may look a little bit sleepy, they can still see the ground perfectly well. Wow, indeed. That camouflage is, is quite insane. Look at that. So often we'll drive past you in the Mawati and you won't even notice them. And you'll notice them because they'll fly off when you drive past. And then you kind of feel bad because that was not your intention. That is crazy, crazy good camouflage right there. I'm glad to see them both in the same spot because I'm hoping that it means that they have got a nest. Which is why I've been coming around to have a look for them ever so often. Just to check if I see them on some eggs which would be great, because maybe we could look forward to another Seb week. Thanks, Trish. Well, how wonderful it would be to have another Seb week experience. That was really a wonderful few months from the end of last year of our little eagle owl hatchling. Here we are, everybody, with our group of males that haven't moved off at all. They've, if anything, become less mobile. There's still a little bit of flicking of tails. But the trunks are on the ground. The trunks weigh a lot, everybody. They can weigh an enormous amount. There's about 100,000 muscles in a trunk. And it requires a bit of energy to be able to keep it elevated all the time. All day long, elephants are moving their trunks around, feeding. You can see the guy in the middle of the screen now. He's actually got his, his trunk hanging over his tusk. He's now moving. Yes, he's going to push somebody. Move. Let's go. Do you see how they all suddenly started moving at the same time? There's communication that's going on with elephants that we can't pick up ourselves. We can't discern with our own ears. They communicate with something known as infrasound, a very low frequency. It's about 5 hertz. We can only perceive anywhere from 18, I think, to 22. So you'll often find herds of elephants suddenly changing behavior, suddenly moving in a direction in unison. And these fellows, I have no doubt, while they've been sitting here by the water, have probably been just chatting about the day or about the plans for the rest of the day. Just very low communication amongst themselves. They will have formed very good bonds amongst themselves. And some of them have probably been hanging out with each other for years. It is very, very cool to see. And you're all saying you love how they communicate with each other. It is very, very cool to witness. Uh, I've been told by a friend that if you sit with a hertzometer in an elephant sighting, you'll actually see the, the, the meter moving and that sort of five, seven hertz range. There's things going on that we cannot pick up. Very, very different frequency. And uh, it's perceived that elephants actually pick that vibration up through their feet. I mean, they do have very, very big ears as well. 
And obviously a lot of this is also very unknown. How is exactly does it work? And they believe they can communicate over 25 kilometers. Some people have even come up with further distances than that, which is a phenomenal feat. they started to figure out that they've spent enough time just chilling at the water and they're trying to go no let's move away from the water let's do some dust bathing first maybe a little bit of ear flapping before they continue on another full day of eating there's quite a few zebra that joined in um, to the scene where we only had a couple of zebra and some wildebeest. Now, there might be close to at least 30 zebra here. Now, the one right in front of us is a little baby. And you can see it's still quite a bit fluffy in comparison to some of the other ones. Um, but often, the, especially the babies, they don't venture too far away from mom. And as soon as they get venture too far off, they just like have this little... Um, sprint and then they run right back to mom but maybe because of the wind blowing so hard you might just hear the wind through the pipes you might hear the leaves and the branches moving and because of that they decided to move into this open area just rest up look at that little one can't agree with more with our viewers that is one of the cutest baby zebra and the thing is with zebra being my favorite that really like this made my day that lion cubs playing and just a scene like this with all these animals So remember earlier we were talking about seeing if a zebra is a male or female by looking at the stripe around the bum. So let's try and look at these ones and see if we can figure out if they might be males or females. So I'm going to try and have a better look with binoculars as well. So if you look at the one, let's use the two on the left, those right there. If you notice the one on the right, whenever the tail moves, there's quite a broad stripe that runs from the base of the tail like down. So that is a female. Now I can't see with the one on the left here because the tail hasn't really moved. But so the male will have a very thin line. Lo looks like the two bum cheeks are quite close together um, in comparison to that of the females. And it might even be the one just slightly right of this one might also be pregnant you see the wildebeest is moving the screen but the other one you can just see the bulge in the belly critter freak i did not know that i never knew the romans called them horse tigers but i can imagine why because of the stripes um how it would resemble that of a tiger of course here we have a little blue wildebeest that's moving into the scene. Now, often um, we see a lot of the blue wildebeest down here, but I would like to know from our viewers. So we've had a look at the zebra and we said the zebra is exactly the same as the ones you get up in the Maasai Mara, but the wildebeest that we see here is referred to as the blue wildebeest. Is it the same wildebeest that you find in the Mara? Now, the other name for them, just as a little clue, so these ones um, have another name. It's called the brindled gnu. Now, the brindle is, you'll notice when they turn, it looks like these, these black stripes that runs vertically around the neck and around the side or the flank area. So, you see from where that hump is in the front leg, you might just notice a few stripes there. But I'd love to know from our viewers. So you'll notice she's looking straight ahead, so that's the direction that the wind is coming from. 
And look how she's pinning her ears backwards. Now that is a very effective way of listening because if she was listening in the direction she is looking in, she would be listening straight into the wind. Now that wind would be making quite a lot of noise in her ears and therefore would not really be able to hear what's up ahead. You will notice though, look how hairy her inside of her ears are. So I'm sure you've seen professionals using microphones that have what they call a dead cat, which is not a very nice name I guess, but they call it a dead cat, which is a cover that goes over the microphone, which is furry and, and helps with wind. And I'm sure all that hair inside her ears serves at the exact same purpose of that as well. It would prevent branches and, and grass and sand from going into the ears, so it would protect the ears and the eardrum. But its primary purpose is most likely to protect the ears from the wind. And so she's pinning it backwards, which therefore allows her to hear what's behind her. And that's also not the direction that the wind's coming in. So she's not having the wind blasted into her very sensitive ears. She's a very clever adaption that they do have. And she's scanning around, looking at this wildebeest again. <laughs> I believe all of you back home are impressed and happy. Trust me, just as happy as I am to see this female cheetah sitting up and just scanning around, seeing if there's a hunting opportunity. And this is the typical time of day when cheetahs would hunt. They don't like to hunt early in the morning, late in the evening, or at night, because that's when all the other predators are moving around. Um, but from about now till the, later this afternoon is the time when cheetahs do like to walk around. It is hot, so that is the one downside to it, so the heat will cause her to use more energy than what she would need to and and overheat her she would walk and rest and walk and rest but she's most certainly using this as an opportunity to scan the area and it's the longest we've seen her sit up all morning so maybe it is a sign that she's going to get moving lions and leopards would typically yawn and groom and yawn and groom before they move but you don't see that as often with cheetah yes they do yawn like she's just did there before they move um, but you won't see it as often, but I think she's going to lie down. Yeah. As she turned around, I, I saw her look at the shade that that grass is casting, and she probably thought, nah, no point me wasting energy. I don't see anything that is worth hunting. And so I'm rather going to sit and wait it out. And instead of going to go look for the impala, let's wait for the impala to come to us. Just notice the wildebeest now slowly moving closer and closer towards the zebra. Now often you do find the zebras and the wildebeest together and we've discussed it a few times but if we look at the one slightly off to the right notice how close the wildebeest they keep their heads towards the ground. Now because wildebeest are ruminants that means they have that four chamber stomach like the giraffe they need a very uh, nutritious diet in order to sustain themselves. Um, so what they do is they will feed off the shorter, lusher grass um, that is a bit more nutritious in comparison to the taller strands of grass that have lost a bit of the nutrient value. So because of the zebras not being the same as a ruminant, they will feed off the top layer, opening up the, the bottom section for the wildebeest to feed on. So that's why sometimes you do find the two that are together. But in this case, it's more of a safety in number. Because of the wind, you find giraffes, you find the wildebeest and the zebra, and they do find safety in numbers because there's even the giraffe now that has gone and lied down. So from where these wildebeest are, just slightly to the left of it, it looks like one of the um, younger giraffes that has gone and lied down. Now with giraffes, because they are, as we termed earlier on, rum ruminants, is if they do lie down flat, the, they, the stomach content will push into uh, their mouth and then they can get pneumonia from that. Judy H, I agree with you. So they are com the different species of wildebeest between us and the Maasai Mara. So the Maasai Mara, you get the um, white-bearded wildebeest, or the other name, the white-bearded gnu. And then here you get the blue wildebeest, um, or the brindled gnu. Now the name gnu, of course, because of the sound they make, that gnu, gnu. 
and uh, just look on these ones especially notice those very dark prominent stripes and also look under their chin you don't notice that white beard like you can see with the wildebeest in the Maasai Mara But if you look at this wildebeest in the sunlight, look at how muscular they are. They, especially their front legs and towards that hind quarters, and they, looks like they are in a very good condition, considering this time of the year where it's the drier parts. So at least we know that we had a good rainy season and it's been abundant food for them in order to be in a good condition. It feels like the wind is slowly picking up. That uh, young baby zebra is also starting to move. So just where it was earlier on, you'll notice whenever it moves, it sticks quite close to mom. Just want to make sure that mom doesn't leave it behind. But what I wanted to point out, look at the height. So this is a baby zebra. Now compare the, the height of the legs in comparison to the mom. Now one of the theories is of course, so predators, whenever they have young, they'll have quite a few young. And the mom can't carry, so let's say a lion, for example, only has a gestation period of between 100 and 110 days. Now, if it had to carry a cub for nine months so in comparison to that of the zebra, it won't be able to hunt effectively. But also, if it had a lot of cubs, it, it will basically, it won't be able to, to hold a lot of individuals, whereas they would then focus on having more individuals but have a longer lactating period, whereas zebra... Because of the youngsters that are so well developed, they have a longer gestation period. And only because there's one, when that youngster is born, it's able to keep up with the rest of the herd. But another theory is, now look at when the zebra is between the mother, the mother and the other ones, they look exactly the same height. If you were a predator and you had to crouch down and look at a, at a dazzle of zebra, you won't be able to pick out which one would be the youngster unless you chase them and they start separating, you'll be able to see it or else you'll look from underneath and all of them would look the same size. So that's one of the ways that the species is able to protect itself or ensure survival. Hey guys, I'm here in the Mulwati and I actually found what I wanted to show you. It's not the python that I've been trying so difficult, um, so, so badly. I've been wanting to show you this python, but I have not found it yet. I have not found your python. I have found you, however, a little jackalberry with the pretty leaves, that really nice colored leaves. A thin, short one with these pinky, peachy, ready leaves that just glow in the sunlight. And I said to you that they don't taste too bad once upon a time. They have these, this nice color um, for a number of reasons. It could be that it deters predators because it can look like old dry or deters herbivores rather um, because it looks like dried leaves do in terms of color. They could be taking advantage of a different type of wavelength so to avoid competition with the other leaves or the other thing that's this kind of color out here are tannins and tannins will also protect these young leaves so that they're not eaten by herbivores too much before they get the opportunity to grow. I have a leaf here that I think is very pretty but I'm going to eat it for you and I can guarantee it's going to be bittery astringent tea. It's not bad, but but it's um 
definitely a stringent tea. I may not swallow this. So I'll, I'll wait for you guys to go before I spit it out. Welcome back to the river. I have moved from uh, the position I was in into this position. And here I have elephants on a standoff with crocodiles. I don't know if we're gonna see any action, but definitely if there will be, the elephant will win. The crocodile to the right, he is a big one, I think. It's one of the biggest crocodiles I've seen in this river. Looks very old, prehistoric, and he's one massive guy. Look at him. Yeah. It's a pity you know, he's not as close to age him, but that could be an easy 50, 50 years or so. He's big. He's a big guy. Yes, I don't know what the elephant is thinking, being so close to the elephants, you know, uh, to, to the crocodiles. Yeah, I don't know what's gonna happen if the elephants are gonna come down and take a drink. I'm not sure what's gonna happen. But let's see, this is interesting, guys. Always nice to see interaction between, you know, super species, you know, big guys, elephants, crocodiles. Oh, one elephant has decided to lie down. <laughs> Good spot. Yeah. The female to the right, she's not happy about something. Okay, let's see. We're gonna kick off that crocodile away from the river. Interesting, let's see. Ha! Huh. Stand off. Yeah, she's thinking twice. That moving of the hair, of the head. Definitely, you know, stinking something. Yeah, definitely she's thinking. Is it okay? Yeah, and the hippos are discussing about something downstream. They be talking about a party. You know, last night they went to. Definitely thinking about something. And looks like she has decided it is not okay for her. Is somebody else gonna pull the strings and decide to go down? That little guy is really patting the other one with his forehead. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah, these elephants are showing very good behaviors, not stressed, very happy little herds, little families. Uh, that, that area where they're in is wet, so it's nice to lie on. Okay, the second elephant to the right has moved closer. Look at the crocodile, not comfortable. Uh, I didn't hear your name, but I did hear the question. Is uh, the crocodile able to pull the crocodile, uh, you know, the elephant, into the water? Descendant, you ask if the crocodile is able to pull the elephant into the water. Well, if it's a good size, it is able, but it risks being gored to death by the mothers. I have seen videos, I've never witnessed myself, you know, an elephant being pulled the trunk. But I've seen videos of where the crocodile has gotten hold of the trunk and the elephant fights back with his tusks and fight, trying to find and gore the crocodile. There's no video that shows that it has fully pulled the elephant in the water and killed it. It would be very easy to drown it if it was to hold on to the trunk and pull it under. But yeah, it, 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 there are videos of crocodiles grabbing but never really drowning the elephants. They have changed tactics, moved further down where there is one crocodile. You can tell that the female is leading and everybody else is following cautiously. Okay, let's watch these, these guys. This is very interesting, at the same time very super special. 
you don't always get to see elephants going into the, you know, to have a drink very close to crocodiles. It's a rare, nice, beautiful. Remember the trunk is used as a hand, the snorkel, as a nose, as a tongue, as a weapon. Yeah, so it's a very useful tool for an elephant. And this looks like a fully grown matriarch with her sister and their offsprings. Yeah, this is a beautiful sight. Let me leave you to enjoy a few seconds without me saying anything. This section of the river is very calm, there's no rapids. Yeah, hippos are everywhere. It's only about maybe 800 meters and I'm sure I have missed out a few port of hippos in between because they, there's no access. And this is another one, you can tell how comfortable they are. The hippos there, they're very comfortable. Okay, I don't know what's gonna happen after they've had their drink. If they do decide to cross, well, I'll be here. I remember everyone had a, or had two hornbills in the Maasai Mara this morning, but here we found another one at Ambion and Gala. So you can see there's one moving from the right to the left. Now it looked like there was a youngster they were slightly off, more left, where this one, almost in the direction that this one is moving in, um, slightly more west. So to give an idea, we are currently on the opposite side of where this bird is. So if I say west, then we are east and that bird is west. So the other one is just slightly left of that. But what it's doing now, it's moving and trying to probably look out for lizards, maybe insects, anything small, probably the size of that beak and smaller um, in order to catch. If there's even a scrub here, they'll go for that. Any bird, maybe bird eggs. Looks like I might have caught something now. Now you'll see when they do, when the adults catch something and there's a baby or a youngster nearby, it would immediately take it and go and feed the youngster. There was a story that Marcel, one of the other cameramen, uh, told me, where. He, I think he saw it up in the Maasai Mara where a hornbill like this was moving and then it picked up a puff adder. And it didn't kill the puff adder, it just walked with it and eventually when it saw something else it would put down the puff adder, catch the insect, eat it, pick up the puff adder again and apparently it carried on for nearly an hour before it eventually killed the uh, snake and then ate it. But on that note, it looks like that hornbill has moved off. James, with most of the hornbills, they actually do, from the ones that I know. So some of them, except in South, in South Africa, I know the trumpets or hornbill, they will focus on something like berries, maybe, maybe fruits, uh, figs. Whereas with something like the ground hornbill, red billed, yellow billed, uh, they might not necessarily, the yellow bull and red bull, because of their size, might not go for a big snake, but let's say if there was a small one around, they definitely take the opportunity, um, I mean, any, any opportunity to get a meal they'll take, but not all hornbills would exactly follow the same diet. Uh, but those that are, we find here, the Lofeld, I would say yes. Love it to see a grasshopper. For me, it means that things are alive, things are happening. It looks a little like a red locust, but it's difficult to tell, obviously, because it's only showing us its antennae to, and its six legs.
let's see here. Yeah, I think it is a red locust because I actually noticed it by it flying. And if I look inside my insect book here, it says hind wings clear with red or purple base and it definitely had a red base. There we go now, that's a nice look. And they're quite large, very large indeed actually. When, I, when it first flew by, I thought it might have been a cysticola. It's beckoning me for bushwalks. Oh, look at that eye. That is so cool. I'm so glad that we managed to see one. Well, it's now hidden, but at least it showed itself to us, letting us know that spring is well and truly upon us. Or at least almost. Welcome back uh, to the river. And looks like everybody has quenched their thirst. And so there's no need to cross. And uh, actually that would have caused lots of panic because uh, this section of the river is quite deep so it would have been very difficult thanks to the matriarch i think she knows that and maybe she's tested the waters and knows that it is not wise to cross so they're huddling back together there are few that haven't come down to drink i don't know if they will but they are happy to be away from the water the female fathers left and the little guy haven't come for a drink I don't know if they will because it also can be very interesting for the little guy if he decides to take a dip. Hopefully not with all this huge crocodile. It's a beautiful scene. I hope you're enjoying this. It's coming from Masai Mara. Talk to us, please. Comments are very welcome. Hashtag uh, CGTN Wild is the place to talk to us or hashtag Wild Earth questions and comments are very welcome this is coming live from the Masai Mara and it's a really really beautiful this is the Mara River and this is the river that all the wildebeest cross further down my colleague David is taking out a spot hopefully we'll be getting a um, crossing today or you know this morning or this afternoon Warren, good morning. You ask if elephants migrate. No, they don't. Elephants don't migrate. Here in the Masai Mara, they just move from one area to the other. They sometimes can be seen very far away, up to 200 kilometers from where I am, but that doesn't mean they're migrating. They're only moving through the ancestral land where the female is leading them to find something that they lack in a specific area, especially maybe where they were. So they don't migrate, they only move from the home range one area to the other. That is a young bull, no question. What's up now? Did I offend you by saying that? Yeah, they can be frisky little, you know, young bulls, the age of 15. Very temperamental sometimes, you know, without, with, without any reason. I've seen them chase vehicles, throw things at vehicles and people. Yeah, this is a beautiful area where they are, plenty of soft grass. And must, it must be very yummy. After all the wildebeest have been here. And, you know, have left lots of dropping and the rain rained, so it must be very uh, yummy grass. Beautiful female coming there, full of character. Look at that old female. Wow. When she comes down to drink, I would love to share, you know, a picture of her drinking with you in a moment. Elephants, this hippos and the crocodile. 
trails. And you can see all of them are out in the sun. And if you carefully look at that croc, she got her mouth opened. This is what they'll do when they look at the sun and get a D. And you can still hear the rapids of the water still staying on the Mara River. Now at one point we had seen some zebras across and we're just hoping they'll come close to the river and maybe cross. Let's see what happens. There they are, that's the herd we're hoping is going to come across at one point if they build enough pressure. But unlike wildebeest that come in big groups, we've seen zebras coming five or ten. And this is really something. I'm very happy always to hear your comments when you go wow. Myself and Bungay, who is on the camera, also feels the same. And you give us lots of energy to bring to you uh, these beautiful sightings of the African wilderness. This is what we are all about. And we bring you the best of the best every morning and every afternoon of every day. Belinda, very good question. How old do the crocodiles get? Uh, Belinda, crocs, just like most reptiles, live for a very long time. Anything 60 to 100 years, depending of course on the species and you know other factors, is a possible age, Belinda. So they live for a very long, long time. And this particular crocodile we have here, it is the Nile crocodile. Hippos, just you know, as an extension to answer you because they're together uh, with that croc there, hippos will or will have a lifespan of about 40 to 50 years. 40 to 50 years. And again, we've got two types of uh, hippos. We've got the pygmy hippo, and what we have here is what we call the river hippo or the common hippo. Now, look at that croc there, Belinda. See, he got the mouth opened. And the whole idea is for them to help in cooling off. And if you look carefully, you can see the teeth just coming out from the jaws of that huge reptile there. Oop. The hippopotamus on the other side was having a yawn. But definitely, you're not going to compare the canine teeth of the hippos to that uh, of the crocs. Few inches, the length of, say, the canines of the crocs. Hippos will almost go to like 20 inches or more, especially on the canines. Bane grazers, but above all, the males may have little big canines because that's what they'll use uh, either to fight for territory or when they would maybe defend themselves. So it's a great sighting to have, you know, these mammals and the reptiles together. And that crocodile, I agree with all of you, he is massive. I mean, some of them will go up to about three meters, 16, 18 feet long, huge, huge, and very long. Some going to about a thousand pounds in weight, and especially the males. But I'm just trying to look how peaceful they are, you know, both the hippos and the crocs. And like, you know, mind your business, mind my business, all of us, we are here for one thing. Let's all get as much solar energy as we can. Now, I, I want to believe the hippos are getting the sun just to warm up. And crocodiles ideally will get the solar energy to help them in digestion much later. There's still a very high possibility of those uh, zebras coming across. So we'll still continue patiently waiting for that to happen. Thanks, David. Well, good luck. Hopefully you get a crossing today. Well, we found the largest of the owls in the area, everybody. 
We were just driving down the road and this fellow got spooked and flew out of the bush and is now up in the top of a very big torchwood and all of the birds are very upset. The giant or the rose eagle owl. You might have seen Trish with the spotted eagle owl before. These fellows are much bigger. And this is the apex predators of the nocturnal world when it comes to, to birds. These guys will feed on all sorts of mammals and birds, even large raptors. Great find indeed. Well, he, he showed us or she showed us where she was. Now the birds know where she is, unfortunately. It's going to get bombarded. So what birds do when they see a predator, or even mammals, they will basically mob it until it moves off. Because when its camouflage has been given away, the predator doesn't show the same or have the same amount of, of physical presence because they're very stealthy. Once the stealthy or camouflaged nature has been revealed, essentially has lost the upper hand. They are a nocturnal predator for the most part. And look at the wind. You can see the wind is really picked up today. You can hear the wind. You can see the wind. I'm going to see if I can try to identify some of the birds. There's definitely forktail drongos and southern black tits. Fahrenheit, you want to know how tall these owls are? I'm just going to double check for you because I don't offhand remember the exact height. So they can get up to 1.7 kilograms, the males, and 2.63 kilograms for the female. And they stand at about 66 centimeters. Very, very common, but not easily seen. are seen. The birds who are part of their diet get very upset. Here's some starlings. I think that's, I can't even tell what that is in the light. That's not a starling. There's some white crested helmet shrikes in the area shouting. Forktail drongos shouting. Let's see with my binoculars who else we can identify. a chagra. I can hear some battises bull snapping. You might think to yourselves, shame, poor owl is being bombed by all these birds, but everybody, this owl is an apex predator. It uh, serves a very important role of, of feeding on small mammalian and bird species. And so it is like the lion to all of these gazelle, all these birds, impalas, looking at this bird going, you must go away. Don't hang out here near my little nest or my territory. Leave. And if it does fly, they will follow and bomb and bomb the whole way. The Foxhill Drongo is being very aggressive in that regard, actually bombing its head every now and again. Smaller birds are far more agile than these large raptors. And it's the element of surprise, as I said, that gives these birds the upper hand. Okay, well, we're going to stay with this bird a moment longer, see what other birds we can identify.
It's so special to see a wild bugs out. And when you see uh, raptors or birds of prey out there, it's always, a good, to me, a good omen because sometimes they might lead you to smaller birds or they might even lead you to a kill. Got a huge hippo there out of the water and he is massive. And by virtue of looking at the size, chances are it could be a bull. Now, I do not know why he is not very close to the group that we have here. Either he belongs to a different group because in the water, hippos are very territorial. But when they're out there grazing, you know, everybody is free for all. But once they're back in the water, you'll see them taking their ground. That's the beautiful Ololo Escarpment, as you all know, the Mara Triangle with its three boundaries. The Ololo Escarpment, the boundary between Kenya and Tanzania, and the third side is the Mara River where we are now. The landscapes of the Mara are just magnificent and we always have a lot to learn, you know, the escarpments, the rivers, the savannas, and we learn more of the same now. The Maasai Mara lies in the Great Rift Valley. It is home to a multitude of animals. The landscapes range from riverine forests to vast plains to volcanic hills. Running through the landscape, a watery lifeline. Rain is a necessity and plays an important role in this ecosystem. It nourishes the grasses, floods the marshes, and feeds the great Mara River. The river flows for about 395 kilometers, originating in the Kenyan Highlands from the Mao Escarpment. streaming down and eventually draining into Lake Victoria in Tanzania. Water is life. This river is a core artery of the Mara. It is a safe haven for hippos and birds. But it provides the ultimate challenge for the wildebeest during the Great Migration. This annual event is one of the natural world's most astonishing spectacles. Nature favors strength. Their migratory routes are determined by the rain patterns as they wander in constant pursuit of water and fresh grass. The Masimara Game Reserve or the Masai Mara Serengeti National Park to ecosystem and to an extent the Ngorongoro Conservation Area sits in the Rift Valley. And its formation and looking at its geology, it has a lot of interesting things uh, to look at. Now, the Mara River is the main life, I would say, or the main artery of this particular ecosystem. And I'm talking about both the Masai Mara and the Serengeti National Park. I'm saying so because the river just flows through both uh, conservation areas originating from Kenya and comes through the Masai Mara 
goes through the Serengeti National Park and then back to the Mara, then to Lake Victoria. Once in a while, we have seen a few rivers drying up in this particular ecosystem, but when this one dries up, then all of us are always very concerned. Because this apparently is the main source of water in this large ecosystem. Yes, well, if any animal knows how to take it easy, it's a hippo. Owls as well spend all day, for the most part, just taking it very easy. And everything's starting to calm down with this owl. So it's not even very easy for you to see his face or her face, is it? So I've got a picture here for you so you can have a look at this wonderful owl. Just look on the dashboard. Let's do this middle picture here. Look at that fellow. Look at those beautiful pink eyelids. Isn't he splendid? That is the owl we're looking at, the giant, also known as the Varro's Eagle Owl. And look at those feet. Mm, two toes forward, two toes back. I think you'd see it in the picture on the right a bit more. Look at those feet. Jason says he's scared of this owl. Well, Jason, there's no need to be scared of this owl. It's, um, <laughs> they can kill small to medium-sized mammals, but uh, we fall out of that bracket. They look a bit ominous there, don't they, though? Wonderful birds. Wonderful bird. There are the eyelids. The purpose of the pink eyelids is really not very well known. Um, why have pink eyelids? I have no idea. But uh, it makes them very easily identifiable. And uh, there's eyes, very, very sharp, piercing eyes, and the sort of satellite dish face that is judging. Definitely judging. Owls, everybody, do fall underneath that category. Everybody feels owls are very wise, aren't they? Very, very wise, but owls, all owls, are predators and feed on a variety of different sort of organisms, especially rodents and bats. Sort of um, controller of those populations. Owls, unfortunately, in southern Africa are, are not regarded as a very uh, many, many traditional and cultural beliefs behind owls. It leads to people believing that owls are the bringers of death. And um, in many of the communities in South Africa, owls are actually uh, not very well looked after. So let's have a look at this guy again. But it's very important to save owls and to have owls in communities because they look after rodents. And well, we know that rodents spread disease. Hello, 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 and welcome back. Yes, I'm back uh, at the road. I've left the river, and look what I found. No hyenas. Yeah, this is the most common hyena in Africa. Spotted hyena, no doubt. You can see that. And right now, he's cooling off. Typical of hyenas, and especially this species, they love water. Whenever they can find it and it's hot, they will submerge themselves. That guy out there, I don't know why he's so close to the other one, but not getting into the water. Uh, you know, I found them in the same position. They haven't moved. He ha you know, they haven't moved much. I've given them enough space so that if they decide to go, it won't be my fault. This is one of my favorite animals. And the main reason is they keep the other predators on check. One animal that gives, you know, the lions a run for their money. They make sure that lions don't misbehave, don't eat everything. They will take kills from lions. Mistaken for many years to be scavengers, but they are not. They make most of their kills. You know, what they eat, they kill. 
they have endurance. They will run an animal down, killing it very ruthlessly, disemboweling it and eating it alive. You know, this is an animal with character, with, you know, okay, I think there's another vehicle that has approached and they are not happy with the sound of a diesel engine. Looks like two fully grown females. Now that one is much smaller, I would say he's a male. Males are much smaller. Yeah, he's been in the mud also. Yeah, thank you for that great comment, uh, to hear that you're all in the, in the same boat as I. Uh, you know, love hyenas, they have character. Look at them, you know, very cheeky and cunning. They might look like cuddly, but this is a very dangerous animal. Very strong jaws, you know, big lungs, big heart, very big nostrils, able to suck in air and can run and run and run. This is a marathon animal. Look at the female. She's so big, you know, you can tell, you can tell by her size. She's very big, weighs almost up to around 40 kilos, 50 kilos. And with that size, you know, she's big enough, you know, to, to you know, to you know, to withstand any lioness. If there are three or four together, they can chase away, you know, a female lioness with ease. And in one sitting, she will eat up to around 30 kilos of meat. So it's a, you know, meat eating machine. Yeah, they have moved a little bit away. I'm hoping that they will come back once the vehicles have left. Look at that pasture. <clears throat> Well, many, many people have always taken hyenas or see hyena as not the very best animals out here uh, in the savannah, but, and they also look them as only scavengers, but hyenas are very good hunters. And not once I have seen them hunt hippos and successfully bringing them down and feeding on them. In general though, they'll always choose the youngsters or maybe a wounded uh, hippo. Once in a while, we have seen uh, hippo bulls you know, fighting, and if the fight is so big and one of them could maybe incur some big serious injuries or fracturing their legs or losing an eye or something, the hyenas will spot it, they will target it and slowly follow it up and they'll hunt them. The only time they don't win very well is when these hippos retreat very quickly in the water and, you know, the hyenas will say, well, from there, you're fighting from your own home ground, not much you can do. But out on land, hyenas have been known to come uh, for these hippos, but definitely not the crocodiles. See a young one just doing a little stroll. Christopher, how long can hippos live? Christopher, anything between 40 to 50 years is a good lifespan for the hippos. And again, as I said, this is particularly to the one you're seeing on your screen there, Christopher, which is the common hippo or the uh, river hippo. We've got another subspecies uh, that is called the pygmy hippo, but 40 to 50 years uh, is the lifespan for hippos. In captivity, of course, we know they could live a little longer they get you know, better care, should they have any health issues, for example, anthrax, uh, maybe the vets will take care of them, but out in the, in the wild, 40, 50 years is the year, the age they live in. I'm looking at some small little three birds on the, one of those hippos there, uh, wondering whether they're ox pickers, and my guess is they could be ox pickers, and they're not busy doing anything just enjoying sitting on that hippo there. Although it's more from the knot, should the hippos have any wounds or they are bleeding, we have seen uh, these ox pickers come in to suck or get some blood uh, from the surface of the surface of the skin. One of the animals that I know got the hardest or the toughest skin is a hippo. And the local name for a hippo is kiboko. And kiboko translates into a lash because when we were in school as small boys and the teachers needed to give us a bit of discipline, they used uh, hippo lashes. And for that reason, you know, we, I have never forgotten that however that name comes from Kiboko, it comes from these animals here. 
It's always quite interesting to see how the hyenas are able to get their teeth uh, through, the, <laughs> through, through the hippos. But again, as I said, the youngsters, I do not think they have such hard uh, skin or tough skin like the two you see there. Better part of the day, out there in the sun, warming up, because at night, chances were they were all out feeding. And they just need to get a bit of vitamin D and some uh, warmth. We'll still wait here because our zebras have moved a little bit far, not very far exactly, but we'll still wait and see whether they will come and cross the river. Welcome back to the hyena scene. Well, from where I am, I think these two guys that I just shared with you, now only one in the frame, are part of the North clan. Remember, for a very long time, they were led by their matriarch female, the, you know, um, she was called Waffles. And Waffles passed away last year, and now the clan is being led by her daughter Soup. We haven't seen her, but this is the area that is the core uh, of their, you know, territory. I would say, I would assume these two females, actually, sorry, it was a male and female, are part of that clan. And so we'll be showing them with you in the next coming weeks. Once we see them, once we identify the den, we'll be sharing you know, how many they are and how they are doing. This guy looks like it's a very healthy. He's been eating well, uh, nothing to worry about when the migration was here. And now he was just uh, relaxing. Sorry for that. We can have a little bit of a break. Yes, sorry about that. We didn't tell you, but Waffle. Um, dead it was told to us by some of the rangers so you know she is no longer around and soup has taken over actually soup had taken over before uh, her mother died so rest in peace waffles is she gonna she is he she gonna come back to the to the mud hole over here or is he gonna head away And Nick, um, thank you for your question. You asked me how fast can hyenas run? Um, they can run at 60 kilometers an hour. Yes, I said 60 kilometers an hour. He just looked at me like he understood English or a word of English there. It was like, did you say that? Yes, about 60 kilometers an hour. And they have endurance to top that for up to almost, you know, a kilometer nonstop. You know, I've seen them run and I tell you, they can go and continuously they can run and run and run. Behind where I cannot see him is a puddle, a very big puddle of lots of water. I don't know if she's going to submerge herself. Sorry, I keep changing, changing. It's a she. Uh, she's going to submerge herself in that water or is it too deep? Okay. She's decided to go around. Where are you going to come to where it's shallower? Let's see. A little bit tense and worried about me, but I mean no harm. You can go in any time you want. Okay. There we go. Must feel very good, you know, to get into that water. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Nancy, <laughs> yes it is, it is mud bath time, well needed when it's hot like this, it's around, I would say 26, 27 degrees Celsius, it is quite hot when you've been out, you know, in the sun the whole morning, it is very, it can be very hot, and you know, with lots of hair and fur like that, you need a mud bath, and it's well deserved, maybe if I stay still for five seconds she might lie down that's what I'm looking forward to it means she is relaxed
pet lover, you ask, uh, is it language that they speak? Uh, did I get that right? If you could ask again, please. Oh, you ask about sleeping? Well, unlike lions that sleep 18 hours after sleeping and after eating, hyenas would actually spend most of the day sleeping but very active at night. So it's about the same time they sleep, the same time they're active. As soon as they you know the sun drops, they'll get very, very active until they get, you know, they get something. So it's about 12 hours that they sleep. Uh, look at that. <laughs> Getting relaxed. Okay, guys, I'm going to try and find a way not to spook her. I'm going to start the vehicle and then try to drive around so that she can enjoy her mud bath without my interference. So I'm going to see you down the road. I'm going to try and leave her in peace. Yeah, as maybe it warms up, chances are the hyena might go look for some place to shade and, you know, keep away from the hot sun. Uh, the last few days we have seen anything from 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock East African time. It has started to get very warm and then later on in the afternoon we have gotten some wonderful showers. I mean, sometimes not showers, but big storms. Now, those zebras are a little deviating from where we were. You say you love uh, seeing a zebras uh, sunbathing, and exactly where they are now, they're just walking in an open area, a lot of sun for them, and they're taking a little detour from where they were. But of course, you can still see them very comfortably, and they're edging closer and closer to the water. You can see that one could be the lead one there, and who knows what they might say to do. Sometimes it takes them a couple of seconds to make a very quick and dangerous decision. Boom, 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 and they go. Apparently, I was at this. Apparently, we are at this very same spot yesterday when we saw a topi coming from the other side of the river and this one topi took about half an hour before, well, 20-25 minutes before deciding to cross the river but we just saw her bolting very quickly towards the river, did not stop. She behaved exactly like what that zebra has done but the topi was different because she came across, crossed the river, there was a croc there and it's like the croc wanted to catch it but then the topi was very fast and she made it i mean it was a single animal but to me it was like seeing thousands or hundreds of wildebeest crossing the river now they have stopped there because i'm not sure the zebra that was leading has sent the right message to them and she was like you know guys uh let's hold on fast It could be uh, dangerous to cross the river. They usually know the dangers they face when they come in this direction. Crocs, like what we've been watching. Lions maybe hiding, laying ambush for them. And more often than not, they'll always wait for them when they cross to the other side, not the side they're coming from. And my guess is they usually know they have a lot of trauma and they're always very nervous crossing the water. And what a great morning it has been. And would like to thank everybody and all of you for your comments and for your questions. Remember, we shall be back here again tomorrow morning, 7.30 East African time and 6.30 Central African time. And on behalf of everybody, be safe. Thank you very much. And from all of us, goodbye.